Hello again, friends. And you are our friends. And welcome back for another happy week of Jim Cornette's drive through with Happy Talk. Here, featuring the leader of the Cults of Cornette, who will be answering your questions. Sent in a number of ways to cornydrivethru at gmail.com or on Twitter using the hashtag cornydrivethru. Someone sent a question this past week 12 times. Guess who's not getting their question on the air? Mr. 12 Times. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and the man who will be answering these questions, the leader of the Cult of Cornette, the exalted one of the Cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. At least you're happy about it. I'm you're trying. happy the guy ain't going to get his fucking question on the program. You're ha- you're I, instead of Brian Last, I'm gonna call you Happy Chandler. That's who you are, Happy Chandler. You're a baseball fan. I'm a very big baseball fan. What do you think of Happy Chandler? Uh, that was before my time as a baseball fan. I met Happy Chandler. Really? He was once a governor of Kentucky. Well, how old were you when you met him? Like fucking four. My, um, we were on a train. I was on a train. I was on a strangers on a train, me and happy Chandler. No, I was on a train with my mom and dad and I met happy Chandler. And I also met Colonel Sanders. It, imagine who you could meet on trains in the early sixties. But, uh, uh, my dad did not know Colonel Sanders, as we've mentioned before, but I, you know, got to meet him and he was wearing the white suit and everything. But he did know Happy Chandler because he obviously was governor of Kentucky. And my father had to work with a number of governors of Kentucky at one point or another. Well, Happy, and was I, no, he was no Bowie Coon. <laughs> he was no Bowie Coon, but he was happy. He was happy about it. And, uh, and all I, all I remember of either one of them is just these, these happy old men smiling. I guess Colonel Sanders wasn't real happy, but he looked happy with the outfit. Do you think it was a, a good thing or a curse to him that eventually he had to wear that outfit everywhere he went? Oh God, he came up with it. It was his whole gimmick. He was never a fucking Colonel of, he invented the thing and then there, that he was a Colonel and then everybody just went with it. (laughs) No, that was his whole fucking By the way, Colonel Tom hey, Parker, hey. not a colonel. Well, there you go. It was the same fucking deal, only at least Colonel Sanders was born and bred right here in the good old USA in the bluegrass state of Kentucky. Whereas, well, I don't even know if he was born in Kentucky, but he lived here for quite some time, whereas Colonel Tom Parker was one of them evil furriners. That's right. You know what his deal was with Elvis? He got 50% of everything he did with Elvis. I'm sure he did. But nothing overseas. Poor, can you imagine how much money Elvis could have made in Japan in the 70s alone? Elvis is one of the biggest examples of money left on the table throughout his entire career. Throughout his entire career. I predict, I, I, if you had been managing Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, if you had been managing him, he would have died a billionaire. He might not even have died at all. You could have cleaned Elvis up, Brian Last. He definitely would have died much richer. I don't know if I could have cleaned Elvis I up. Thought you were gonna, he definitely would have died. But he would have. I don't know if anyone could have helped Elvis at that point. You could have got him off the peanut butter and jelly. You <laughs> could have got you could have got him on on. You know what? You could have got him on the athletic greens. That would have That's helped. what you could have got him on. And I'll just say this right now: we won't even wait till later on in the program. I got an email from one of the listeners. Because I had made this comment earlier, and and he responded, and 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 f- found common ground with me. Uh, Nick, I get Nick from Australia. I won't use a last name. I guess there aren't that many Nicks in Australia anyway. I guess. Greetings, Jim <laughs> and Brian. I would just like to take the time to say thank you to introducing me to Athletic Greens. I wasn't going to say anything until Jim mentioned it on the Experience last week about it helping your poop. But I used to shit like a horse after everything I ate. But now, since I've been having athletic greens every morning, my bowel movements are much better. So right there, you have testimony from the Cult of Cornet listeners on the efficacy of, of another of the fine products that we promote here on the various podcasts, the drive through and the experience. And like the folks at Athletic Greens, I said, it, instead of... Blending up a bunch of shit, making a mess of your kitchen, making it look like you've thrown a possum in a blender all over your fucking countertop. 
and you're bad on that. You know, you every time you blend something, people have to come in when, in hazmat suits. Well, now you can just take the athletic greens, mix it up in the in the mixer provided with the and 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 drink it and go boom whether you're keto free paleo free vegan free dairy free gluten free all the frees whatever kind of diet you got it's friendly to everything one gram of sugar and not only does it help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet it helps the energy the recovery the gut health the immune support but also it helps your poop and lord knows with the things going on in the world we all need to poop better and more regularly. So, regardless, invest in your health. The folks at Athletic Greens are standing by now. Go to athleticgreens.com slash JCE to claim the special offer of 20 free daily travel packs with your first purchase. That's a $79 added value. Athleticgreens.com slash JCE. I'm telling you. The folks at home are telling you, you'll feel better, you'll digest better, and you'll poop better. And and what more can we ask from life? I was drinking my Athletic Greens while you were doing the Athletic Greens spot. I well, gotta- see, it, it, they're just everywhere. They're, they're on the forefront of American society today. If you're not drinking them, you're hearing about them. That's right. All right, what are we doing today on this program? Do you know I had a I had a, 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 a disruptive day yesterday? And I will mention this right now, and it wasn't anybody's fault. But uh, but I've been telling the folks, uh, the customers at jimcornette.com, Cornette's collectible store is open, has been open for the past 10 days or so. And but the orders are coming in, but we're keeping up with it. I'm actually ahead now of what I can take to the post office, and I'll tell you why. And it comes down to Jim Cornette. You're just too nice a guy. Saturday morning, made my post office run, got there at 9 a.m., two cars in a parking lot, and my heart leaps. I'm like, whoopee, whoopee. I sort of felt like getting out and doing jazz hands, like Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. <laughs> I'm like, it's going to be a breeze because this international morning, I'm shipping internationals. You got like 15 or 20 of those. Go in. Freeze station is empty. What happened? John's there. John doesn't take Saturdays off. He's a dedicated man. Also an older and slower man. I said, John, you got any backup here? Anybody to help you? No, I'm by myself. Haven't seen Bree. I think she called in. Ah, shit. John's by himself. The one hour that Bree could process these 20 international packages in has just become anywhere from two hours to neither me nor John will live that long. Plus, if he's the only clerk, that means I'm going to have a line in six feet apart. I'm going to have a line out in the parking lot behind me by the time he'd even get halfway through this. So I have erred on the side of safety. Discretion is the better part of valor. I gave up my spot for the people that were already coming in behind me. I said, John, I'll come back on Monday morning. I'm not going to clog you up like that and ruin everybody's weekend. Because I'm compassionate like that. Does he know? I mean, does he get upset the fact that your attitude is basically you're too slow to handle my packages? Well, no, well, no, no, because he knows that. See, also, I'm creating a chain reaction. Think about this. He's the only clerk. If I've got him for an hour, there's going to be a riot behind me. You know how many chain reactions you've created that caused a riot in your life? Well, (laughs) we're we're going to look at one of them later on today. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, and, and also he said, he admits he is not the fastest clerk. So while, while Bree is processing my package at a higher rate of speed, I often talk to John about Beatles trivia. So we're all friendly, but he don't. And also he does, he sometimes has to do passports so he can't get clogged down with a long transaction. He has to be nimble. I can't say that on, he has to be, he has to be, uh, flexible to go where he's needed. I've never heard you talk about the Beatles. Are you good with Beatles trivia? Well, I just, you know, a little bit, not an expert, but at the same time, he's a Beatles collector. So he often talks about what, what he's gotten in the mail. For example, he, he got uh, one of the early Beatles records that was 
press before they got a record deal, but then was was re-released by a boutique label at some point afterwards, but also got a a piece of stationery uh, with the offices of Dr. Winston O. Boogie and... <laughs> and uh, uh, what uh, what the fuck name did Elton use? Did he use Reg Dwight or did he use something else? But anyway, when when Lennon and, and Elton John were hanging around in in fucking New York, when he was uh, Lennon was separated from Yoko, and he became Doctor Winston O Boogie. Anyway, stuff like that. But nevertheless, I was going to do a plug here. You got in my way there, pal. No, um. So I, I lost a mailing day. So internationals are going out on Monday. And then that backs me up. I've already got some orders that I've just, I've got too much to take to the post office. So I'm building some things up. But point is, if you order the fine products at jimcornett.com, uh, and we are shipping four mornings this week. So expect uh, a five to nine day turnaround from the time I get your order until the time it's in the mail. We're still keeping up with these things. And we thank you for your support. I won't sell any specific items because they sell themselves. And I'm afraid I'll, if I do that, if I'm too uh, aggressive with these sales plugs, the sales go up and I can't handle it. So I'll just, I'll still keep it a little, a little low key. All right. That's what I had to say. Are you a fan of John Lennon solo material? Some yes. And some no. It seems he had a, it, he was like the super eight motels on the interstates. He had a wide range. Some of them are brand new and spotless and others. You look like you'd washed a dog in the room. Um, I, I was a big fan of watching the wheels. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. I would really love to watch them roll. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. See, it's weird hearing that song because of when it came out. The fact that it came out right before he died. Yes, he finally decided, I'm going to fucking sit down and enjoy life because I'm a multimillionaire and I'm fixed until I'm 80. And then he has to fucking leave the house. See, that's why I don't leave the fucking house. I think, you know, a lot of people point to Imagine or uh, Mind Games. There's so many great songs, but some of the albums are hit or miss. But the first album he did, Plastic Ono Band, where it's just him and Ringo and Klaus Vorman on bass, it's one of the most extraordinary albums ever. It's just so raw. It's amazing. Well, well, well is on that album. You ever heard that album? I have not. I'm sure I've heard pieces of it, but I've never sat down and listened to the entire album. It is. It's extraordinary. And then Yoko, I was a big fan of, of Klaus Vorman there. Were you really? No, I don't know who the fuck that was. Klaus Vorman. <laughs> what the and fuck? Astrid, was that his name? Klaus Vorman, real guy from Germany. Him and Astrid. I was just I was just guessing because I couldn't remember what Klaus's last name was. They befriended the Beatles when they came to Hamburg. And they were into, you know, British rock and roll or rock and roll in general. And they met the Beatles and befriended them when the Beatles were playing nonstop in the red light district. And the only people at their shows are like strippers and fucking shady figures. And they became friends with Klaus and Astrid. She took all those early photos of the Beatles. He, okay, I remember, because I've seen some of those and in one of the Beatles books, and I remember Astrid. I didn't remember Klaus. And then he became a bass player. I think he played with Manfred Mann for a while, but he played a lot of, uh, I think he played with George Harrison. I think he did the Bangladesh concert, and he played with John Lennon, and he became a, a bass player. Uh, I don't know if he's still alive, but uh, she just died this past year. Do you remember here? One Beatles trivia question for you. Simple one. Okay. Name the five members of the Beatles who went to Hamburg. Oh, God damn it. Um, shit. Well, it was uh, obviously John Lennon, Paul McCartney, fucking uh, George Harrison, Pete Best, and what was the other one's fucking name? Randy Rose. Randy? No. <laughs> Stuart <No>. Sutcliffe. <laughs> Stu Sutcliffe. Okay. And and then he dropped out early because he he just, it wasn't for him. Wasn't that the deal? Well, it wasn't for him. He was more of an art student than the other art students in the band. He fell in love with Astrid. And then he died at the age of 21 of a brain hemorrhage. So he died before they hit. I think he died in 63. He died before they really hit. Well, if they had a really hit, he would have died anyway. 
Because then he just said, fuck, I quit the Beatles. Oh, my God. They had Pete Best on Letterman in the 80s. It's like such a sad appearance. He seems like a nice guy. He seems pretty upbeat and chipper, all things considered. But <laughs> how is he not just counting the money every day that he didn't make? <laughs> Ringo, really? Ringo, not me? Ringo? Ringo? <laughs> it don't come easy, you know. Back off, Boogaloo. All right. Well, back off and and uh, boogaloo on up to uh, what this show is supposed to be about. Oh, and later on, we're going to watch a watch along. You 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 milked me on this till the last moment, so we're total going into it almost totally unprepared. But we're going to watch the very first Midnight Express versus Magnum TA and Mister Wrestling Two match from Houston, Texas, and Mid South Wrestling. January 27, 1984, and we're doing this because even if you don't have the network, it's on YouTube. So uh, once again, we're, 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 we're appealing to our cheaper fans today. You can get it for free. And I think people really get a kick out of it. We'll talk more about it later. But those matches with the Midnight Express in Houston in 1984, every one of them that pops up, especially the ones with no commentary, are amazing because the crowd is going nuts throughout the entire match popping for everything you almost cause a few riots i mean there's the fame <laughs> the videos out there i had never actually seen the specific clip i don't know if i just didn't notice it where you're at ringside going nuts at the express of the rig and the crowd is going crazy and bosch comes and puts his hand on his shoulder and just angrily like swings you around and tells you to get back to the locker room well, and that there's there's actually uh, I think three matches on YouTube out there uh, of Midnight Two and TA from Houston. Three of the what, four. You guys have three four of the four consecutive yeah. shows. It's amazing. Uh, well, how is that amazing? Fucking Jerry Lawler and Jimmy Valiant did thirteen weeks in a row in the Louisville Gardens. You know, um, when people think Midnight Express nineteen eighty four, and maybe it's not fair, but they usually think right away Rock and Roll Express or Fantastics. The fact that you guys did four matches in a row in Houston against two and TA and the crowd is going nuts for all four matches with 2020 eyes. That's amazing. Well, let's wait. I'll, I'll give you even more background. Uh, let's wait. And then when we do the watch along, uh, it'll be in one piece, but, uh, this was also for those keeping track, our third live appearance in the city of Houston, Texas, that they had never seen or heard of neither of the three of us until six weeks beforehand on mid South television. So then we'll, 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 we'll set it up later on, but we're going to have a little fun, a palate cleanser today of good old fashioned classic wrestling to get the taste out of your mouth from what you've been watching lately, folks. All right. Well, let's start off with a question that several people have sent in. It's something that just happened just in the news. I know you appeared on live with Regis and Kathy Lee in 1993, but the death of Regis Philbin, what are your thoughts? Oh, man, I saw that, and actually, um, somebody had tweeted that clip here not long ago just for no reason otherwise than they found it, and I had watched it again, and 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 actually, that my mother got a kick out of that, to be honest with you. When when she had, after she had passed away, we were cleaning out her stuff and everything here at the house, we, she had, she didn't label a lot of her videotapes. If I sent her something, it would say, you know, Jim on, you know, pay-per-view or this or that or whatever, is she just taped stuff and watched it later, whether it's her football games or, you know, different TV programs or whatever. But she had written on the front of this one, Jim on Regis, because <laughs> that was a big deal to her, uh, even, you know, outside the wrestling business. Um, I guess a, a lot of people, you know, knew that Regis Philbin was a wrestling fan from, him having all these WWF guys on his shows uh, over the modern era, the attitude era. And, you know, since then, but the reason why, one of the reasons why he liked wrestling so much is because when he was a young man in local television in Los Angeles, he, he liked wrestling then too, but he was nobody. And Freddie Blassie used to come on his local show in LA when Blassie was the biggest fucking the star in California wrestling and probably, you know, when you think about it, <clears throat> here's, here's the interesting thing in Los Angeles, California, even in the sixties and early seventies, especially at early seventies run with Tolos and Blassie. But in the sixties, Los Angeles was the seat of the Hollywood entertainment TV movie industry, but the biggest local television star 
in Los Angeles was Fred Blassie. All those movie stars were in movies that were all, and they were making network TV shows that were shown all over the country, but nobody was on a higher-rated television program in the actual city of Los Angeles than Fred Blassie, right? So, anyway, Blassie would come on Regis's uh, talk show, and it, it got Regis's show attention, and he never forgot that, and he was friends with Blassie, you know, till Freddie died. And I think it was actually San Diego off the LA TV. I think he had his TV show in San Diego. Well, there you go. Even, but well, still San Diego, Los Angeles. What's the difference? No. Um, uh, well, still LA still is correct with Blassie being the yeah. biggest star. When you think about it in, in local television in Los Angeles, fucking uh, Regis was in San Diego, part of the territory. They stayed together, you know, as friends for years and years. And, it wasn't that Regis came to all those shows. I mean, obviously they, they booked him for, you know, the, some of the pay-per-views, WrestleMania appearances he made, but he came to other shows and it's not like he was just doing it for a payoff. Sometimes he was there, even if he didn't appear and, uh, you know, over the years and he always enjoyed having the guys on and, you know, the, uh, the time I was on with Yoko, he loved that shit, the fucking tug of war and all that stuff. And, and, you know, when he was, when he was kind of like shoulder bumping Yoko and Yoko would give him the mean face, he loved that shit. He liked to put the boys over and, and, and just, you know, put the business over. So that was, that was uh, for what, 40 years you could find him, you know, uh, having wrestlers on his shows, the, the bigger and bigger and bigger that he got. And of course, the the greatest game show moment in history, and and I just retweeted this here just a little while ago because Shane Helms had tweeted it, a, a clip of it out when he was hosting Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and the guy that won the million, John Carpenter, not the movie director, but just some schlub, but he knew every fucking thing. He answered every question, all the way up to the million dollar question, without even using a lifeline. And then he gets asked the million dollar question and the million dollar question. God damn it. If I could have got there, I could have won it too. the million dollar question was what U S president appeared on laugh in. And he gave four choices. Obviously Nixon was one of them. But he says, I got to use a lifeline. I want to call my dad. So he calls his father on the phone. They pipe him through. And the guy says, hi dad, I don't really need your help. I just want to tell you, I'm about to win the million dollars. And the fucking place blows for like a minute and a half, right? But um, but anyway, yes, Regis, he was, and he was a nice guy. And it's not like he came in and sat down and bullshitted with us before the show. It's a network TV show, and you know we're one of the segments. Uh, so it's not like he just you know came in, sat down, and we had fucking chicken and hot dogs and fucking a bunch of you know uh, uh, old stories. But he was very nice and fucking no issue at all, and. Hey, love you guys and blah, 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 put us over on the show. And then we were right out and flew that same day to goddamn to Detroit. We went right in and right out because we had to do SummerSlam. But who was the girl that it wasn't Kathy Lee? Kathy Lee was off that day. And there was an, I can't ever remember what the girl's name was that was his co host, but she didn't seem too amused by all the proceedings. I don't know. Usually it would be his wife, but I don't think it was his wife. It wasn't his wife. It was some other actress slash celebrity person. I cannot remember. God damn it. But she was guesting because Kathy Lee was not there. Did you meet Gelman? Uh, I don't remember Gelman. Don't remember meeting Gelman. We got there, they carried us straight over. We'd flown in the night before. They carried us straight over the fucking, uh, from the hotel to the, to the, uh, studios, put us in the green room, a little prep. Okay. We're going to do this segment go to break, come back, do this. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Boom. We went out and did it. They put us in the car and straight back to the airport, flew to Detroit. It was, it was a, it was a quick one as they say. And you had your neck brace on, just like you did at SummerSlam, because you were selling the angle that you did in Smoky Mountain. Oh, well, yeah, but and I told Bruce, because Bruce is the one that called me on the phone and said, hey, we've got you all on Regis and Kathy Lee. And I and already when I heard that, my first thought was, i got to fly to New York, do this fucking show, and then all the way to Detroit, right? 
Um, but I said, now, you know, I'm going to be wearing the neck brace. He said, what? I said, I just, I'm doing the fucking angle. Armstrong gave me a pile driver two weeks ago. I'm wearing the neck brace. Okay. <laughs> hey, I wasn't going to goddamn go on national TV that was going to show in Knoxville and make bullet Bob Armstrong seem like a goddamn liar. So that neck brace came in. I wore it in the green room too. It's not like I fucking came in spry and turning cartwheels and put it on to go on television. There was no reason to smarten the goddamn whole network up. When it comes to Fred Blassie, do you think people really appreciate how big a star he was, not just in LA, but Atlanta? He was one of the biggest stars in Atlanta for years. I mean, they, I think Watts brought him back when he was booking there in like the late seventies, even. Yeah. Well, a show. no, nobody does understand how, how big he was because he was around for so long but also so much of it was before television and, and, you know, uh, videotape and it's uh, well before television, but you know what? Well, he was, we was around before television, but I mean, before videotape and, and the modern shit people see, but no, he was for what? 15 years. He was just a journeyman, as they used to say, uh, you know, guy on the card, dark hair, uh, you know, especially in the Midwest, cause he was, you know, around St. Louis, he worked a lot. He was here in Louisville a lot in the forties and, and early fifties. And, but then by the time when he went to Atlanta in the fifties and bleached his hair and became a really strong heel and television helped him because he could fucking talk. Cause Freddie was, he wasn't glib. Like some people say, I am with the vocabulary and the one-liners and the blah, 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 blah. But he had that gift of bullshit because he was a smooth ladies' man type. He always had a, he always prided himself on being a ladies' man and had a line for them and had a line just from hanging out with guys and fucking being in the business for so long and he'd heard so much bullshit. And that's it. It came naturally to him. So he'd cut the fucking promos. And he didn't mind going on TV in Los Angeles and telling the people that he'd heard all about these women. And it's nothing like the fucking women he's heard about. That they're all pigs and they're cows and they wear potato sacks. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, they're all ugly. Nobody did that back then. So not only Atlanta, he was huge in the 50s to, to the point where they were. And then later on in the 60s when he had to quit wrestling in the 60s for what, a year and a half? He had one of his kidneys taken out. Uh, he had a car lot in Atlanta, sold cars and they advertised in the, in the wrestling program, but everybody in town knew who Fred Blassie was. So they'd come and buy a car from him, but he didn't like selling cars. So he came back and, you know, with one kidney, but, uh, in LA, he was huge because of that local television and, and some of those stand up interviews with Jewel Strongbow, the matchmaker, not the, not the wrestler. Um, you know, are just hilarious for their time because everybody else back then was so bland because the interview was still new and a lot of the guys were new at it. But fucking Blassie's just tearing people up. And uh, the only reason that he left California, he was still the fucking top babyface in 1973, but the commission wouldn't relicense him because he was past 55. And he was still the top babyface in the territory. It couldn't hardly do anything, but they just fed people to him and he bit him, punched him, kicked him, and made him bleed and beat him. Yeah, you know, Tolis Blasty is one of those matches I wish I could see, even though I know as a classic wrestling match, it was probably the worst match of all time. <laughs> John Tolis yeah. against Blasty in 72 was probably awful, but I probably would have well, well, really enjoyed you, it. You know what? Tolos then was still, he, Tolos was an incredible worker. John Tolos was one of those guys that, all of his work was good and solid. Nothing was spectacular, but everything was, looked good and was sharp. And he was, all, you know, he and his brother Chris were a tag team and, and had had, you know, quite a bit of success at places, but he'd never been a main event guy. And he could talk. He could cut to promo, which was what L.A. at that point, the territory was more geared to anyway, was talking him in. He could do that. Um, he just, it, it, it if it hadn't been for as over as Blassie was and the, the shocking nature of the angle where Tolos blinded him and the, the way that they carried it out, it was the right place, right time. But I guarantee it, Tolos's work was fine. He, his work matched up with, you know, most people. 
it just that there was and, and his promo it just the look or whatever it never clicked anywhere else except in that particular spot with it with a guy that was over his god like Blassie. When it comes to the promos, you would know probably better than most. Isn't the story, although Muhammad Ali gave credit to Gorgeous George, it was probably Fred Blassie that was actually the promos he was watching that influenced yes. the way he talked? Yeah, because, well, and, and, and in part, and of course there was a lot of, I think it, 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 the wrestling promos, first of all, with Ali influenced more the concept of what he did rather than the exact verbiage because the, the rhyming shit blasted or George, neither one rhymed, but it, it, some of that was some of old Southern bullshit, little Tom Boogaloo shaft, uh, some Southern Baptist preacher stuff, the black church. Uh, but the, the story that Ali told always was that he had, uh, he had uh, done a radio show promoting one of his first fights. Where was it? Vegas. And he, the wrestlers came in and, and the, one of the wrestlers cut this promo and just basically just annihilated verbally his opponent and said all this shit and everything. And they drew a bigger crowd in town than, than Ali's fight. And then later on, he would say that it was gorgeous. George. Um, but then, but not, no, and we should just say gorgeous George, one of the most over gimmicks ever. And one of yes. the most influential wrestlers ever, not necessarily known as one of the great talkers of all time. Well, but also Ali didn't turn pro until after he won the 1960 Olympics, right? The gold medal in the Olympics. By then George was drunken on the way out of the business he was huge earlier but las vegas in those days could have been a spot show from the los angeles territory and the point is is that years later when fred blassie was a manager in the wwf vince mcmahon jr uh and the wwf uh, wwf then helped co-promote the ali Inoki closed circuit extravaganza in 76 and vince gave blassie uh, put Blassie in the situation as a manager to try to talk up and do some publicity. And Ali said, no, wait, you're that guy. You're that guy. You're the guy that I fucking heard. And Blassie was always, you know, impressed by that, that he said that. But then because Gorgeous George was a more mainstream wrestling name than Fred Blassie, when Ali went back to telling the story, he started crediting Gorgeous George again. Here's what I think. I think it was Blassie because Blassie was from St. Louis, especially during the, if, if Ali was born as I believe he was in 1942 ish, one ish, two ish, Fred Blassie would have been the guy doing television in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in the, in the early 1950s, both here's the thing. Louisville had wrestling from, Chicago on, but also there were intermittent local wrestling programs through the fifties. And definitely Blassie appeared a number of times, as I just said, in Louisville live in the forties and fifties, gorgeous George appeared here too, but gorgeous George never called his opponents names or did that blah, blah, blah. So I think that probably Ali had seen Blassie more than he had seen gorgeous George and just took a little bit from everybody because really neither one of them sounded like I'm floating like a butterfly sting, like a bee, Joe Frazier, you better test your endurance. You're going to need more insurance, whatever the fuck. And you know, so it was just the idea of trash talking that Ali got from professional wrestling of hyping the fight of never breaking character or not breaking it except when, whenever you can't help it. And of, of, you know, trash talking your opponent and, and hyping the fight, which is old as the hills, but he saw it from wrestling because it, especially in those days in boxing and pro boxing, they were trying to be of a higher moral ground and didn't condone that type of thing, especially from these uppity young Negro athletes, as he would have been called in the late fifties and early sixties doing that. What he what he was called later on when he began doing it. So he took it from wrestling 
I don't know that he took any of it other than the concept from any one particular person is what I'm saying. And it's funny too, because then the Ali promo would go on and influence wrestling because Billy Graham would steal from that. And then Dusty would steal from Billy Graham and it would work its way back through professional wrestling from wherever Ali got it from. But see also original Fred Blassie. Also, Billy Graham stole it from because he was a fucking evangelist preacher in his younger days before wrestling. And that's where Tom Boogaloo Shaft got it because of the black church services in Mississippi, which is so it it's, it, you know, there's a level of influence in all of that. And the, the people who were special were the people who took the idea, but gave it their own twist. With Blassie, the other interesting thing about him being with Ali for the 76 match with Anoki is it was a big deal in Japan because we talk about Blassie being yeah. a major star in California and Atlanta. He was massively over as one of the big opponents of Ricky Dozan, sharpening his teeth in Japan. So they knew him already. Having him with Ali against Anoki was a big deal. Yeah, it was like, and, and the the story, which was magnified over the years, legitimately when Blassie made his his first run in, in Japan and was on television, even in the black and white days, and he had sharpened the teeth and they called him a vampire and he bites the head of one of the Japanese guys and he starts bleeding and they get to close up. Some old man had a heart attack and died watching fred blassie and it made the papers so by you know by the time blassie was finished with it it was a hundred <laughs> people had a heart attack and died yeah. you know yeah but and that was on network television and those high ratings at the time because in japan at that point there was like maybe there was with their two stations right so everybody saw the fucking thing anyway and yeah like you said then almost 20 years later there comes the vampire that killed these Japanese citizens, according to legend and lore, the shock of seeing him and his brutality. And he is managing the, you know, the most famous boxer in the world against our hero, Antonio Inoki. It meant more in Japan than it did here, as you said. Well, Jim, let's get another question here on the show. This is a topical one. This was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Jacob Cordell. What does Jim think about this quote from Cody Rhodes after he was asked if he was a heel or a babyface? Oh, here's, boy. Here's the quote from Twitter. I'm neither. I'm a competitor and a reigning champion. Tired old tropes are even more insulting to the viewer, considering I've been on their TV since I was 20. It ain't black and white. It hasn't been in forever. Circumstances of the match dictate who we cheer for beautiful thing so what are your thoughts on cody rhodes this is not the first time we've seen it by the way another tired old trope is cody rhodes using the term tired old tired trope old trope every time this comes up but what are your thoughts on at cody least, rhodes at opinions? Least it, if it's if it's related to wrestling shouldn't it be a trope <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if from now on if, if it's wrestling if it's related to wrestling it needs to be a tired old trope <laughs> you know there is a glimmer down there in what he's saying of sense and logic and i'll tell you what it is in the days when professional wrestling as an industry had all agreed that they were not gonna fucking blab about every little fucking secret and not laugh at their own business and it was treated and presented as a sport you had the guys, the good workers, the great workers, who could carry a, a, either a, a match as either a babyface or a heel, depending on the circumstance, because they were a champion defending. And those folks were called the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And whether it was Jack Briscoe or whether it was Dory Funk Jr. or whether it was uh, Pat O'Connor was much more babyface-ish than he was heel. But, and Buddy Rogers was more heel than he was babyface. Uh, and Luthez was the epitome of a guy like this, that he was neither heel nor babyface. He was the fucking guy that everybody wanted to take down. And that works. When you have a product that is presented as a sport, when you have one guy with that the, the focus is on as, as a champion that takes on all comers that's wrestling in that position and that style, 
And then you could even open it up a little bit in the old territory days where the whole country didn't see everything that was going on, and you could have another one of their two of those guys around as champ regional champions in different places if they were established. And yes, most of the time, they would be honorable, but when they wrestled a really hot baby face, they would do subtle things in the match. They might pull trunks. They might not break quickly. They might give a fucking elbow shot to the fucking side of the head on the break, or they might, or they might take a, a, a cheap win or a shortcut or whatever, because they had to, in that instance, to beat that guy. And that's what he's talking about. We are a long way away from the time. And he is a, in a company that's a long way away from presenting anything like a sport. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't work when you're the TV champion. If he was the world champion, which I actually think he still should be, if Cody should be the champion if it ain't Jericho. I don't know why they got it on fucking Stone Cold Cosplay. Um, but when you're one of a number of champions and they've got bigger booking issues than 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 the fine points of Cody's psychology. The point is there's things that it, it, Cody, even in a, in a situation where what Cody's trying to do by being the neither he's a baby face, but he's going to take a few shortcuts when somebody pisses him off or rouse him up or he feels put upon. But there's still things that that person would never do. Cody would never just full on, for no reason, kick a guy in the balls or fucking steal something from him unless it was retribution or assault the guy's wife and dry humper. That's not something Cody Rhodes would do. That means he is a baby face. He's just a baby face that doesn't mind fucking breaking some rules if, if he's pissed off, which is basically Hacksaw Jim Duggan. You need fucking baby faces and heels because of the nature of what wrestling is supposed to be. The idea that you are seeing two people have a fight that have a firm dislike for each other, if not an outright hatred, and they're having a fight or a match or a contest or whatever you want to call it, see who's going to win. Therefore, the fans, to be specifically, especially interested in it, need to have somebody to cheer for or somebody to, to root against. There has to be some strong feeling, which is why Vince McMahon Sr. never wanted to do a babyface match. Because what's the upside? Who, who do they want to see win, Bruno or Pedro? They don't want to see either one of these guys lose, which is why they did a draw. And also, business-wise, how the fuck do you do that finish? In those days, your ethnic hero had to be an ethnic hero and undefeated. But also, he didn't think there would be strong interest. And he got uh, proven right, even though it was bad weather, when he went outdoors and drew 2,000 people more than Madison Square Garden would have seated. You got to have somebody to cheer for, and you got to have somebody to boo. You got to have some strong emotional investment. I want to see that guy get his ass kicked or God, I want to see that guy get even. So, you know, you know, there doesn't have to be a baby face and a heel in every single match. You can have the wrestling matches, although they seldom do. The Timothy Thatcher, Oney Lorcan matches on the card to make wrestling look good. And you can have some nice exhibitions every now and then, but as a general rule, it's easier to have the match. It's easier to enjoy the match. It's easier to understand the match. And it's easier to sell tickets for the match. If people give a shit one way or another about who wins or who loses. That right. may still, it may still one more thing. It may still be old fashioned today when nobody gives a shit about that anyway, because they're just watching a goddamn, you know, Cirque de Boucher routine. But it, 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 it does help when you actually have a real good match and get the people. And Cody should know that because he's the only one in AEW that consistently has real good matches and gets the people. Go ahead. 
Well, I think Cody spends too much time trying to get himself over as the wrestling sage, you know, which is just complete nonsense. Well, he needs more parsley, rosemary, and thyme. But you can't look at FTR and AEW and not tell me that if they had come in as strong heels, it wouldn't have been more effective. Oh, good God. Of, co- of, of course. If, if, well, well, we'll watch the watch along and we'll let the people of Houston decide here in a little while. But if you come in as strong anything, it's a positive. They didn't come in as, as strong. They came in as strong shit and they got their shit stolen and helped out by their big rivals and fucking blown off when they offered somebody a beer in the first two weeks. So fuck you. All right. Well, something- you know what? I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what to think when I hear people say these things. Like, they don't, oh, baby face and heels. Pass. It's a, it, it, Cody Rhodes is saying the same thing that Vince Russo was saying 20 years ago. And it didn't make any more sense then when Shitstein said it as it does now. Oh, that's. There's shades of gray. Yeah, shades of gray is shades of don't give a fuck. And all you do when and and shit stain was bad at this. I'm not saying that Cody or anybody else is anywhere near this bad. But when you have a guy who is any any creation of any creative person, a character in a novel or a a a, a character person in a movie or whatever, or in wrestling, you have to have in mind that they don't do shit that that person wouldn't do. Suddenly, if Bruno Sammartino had stood in front of Pedro Morales and instead of shaking hands and saying, okay, now we're going to wrestle, he'd have just hauled off and kicked Pedro in the balls, it would have been shocking, but it wouldn't have got over because nobody would have fucking believed it. People in wrestling, the characters, the gimmicks, whatever in wrestling still have to do things that that person, the fans think that person would do that or he wouldn't. When Steve Austin hugged Vince McMahon, that killed the fucking whole deal because people that Steve Austin would not do that. So you, that there's some people you couldn't turn heel. They were so baby face and it just killed them off or vice versa. And, and, and shit stain was always big on the swerves by having a bunch of guys that were over, then turning around and doing something that they blatantly would not do. If they were the person that they had been presented as and were purported to be, they wouldn't do that. It was all just for a swerve. And that's where the people tuned out because he didn't understand that it's still the people take you as either a fucking nice guy or a prick And you have to amplify those fucking qualities to get over strongly in one direction or another. And once you do, if you get over like that, then if you do something that that person that you're over as wouldn't do in the fan's mind, then you've just made it fucking bogus and fake. And that don't get over. So everybody has to be a baby face or a heel. It's just whether they're good at it or not. And if you're just in the middle and you do shit back and forth, nobody gives a fuck about you anyway. But, as I was about to say, it disturbs me hearing people that I know say this, or that I know know better, say these things, to the point, honestly, Brian, where I believe I need some help. I don't just need help. You know what I need? You know what I need, Brian? I need better help. And I will illustrate this with another email from the Cult of Cornet listeners. I will not mention his name. But he's a longtime listener. I recognize him also as a customer of the cult of, of the Cornets Collectibles. And he said, I wanted to thank you for your podcast. It's helping me through a lot. I found my bookie and better help due to you. Because of this pandemic, I haven't been able to go to the movies or see my friends. I get caught up on stuff at home like writing and watching old wrestling. I'm on the last year of Smoky Mountain, starting on 1982 in Memphis almost to your debut in Mid-South and close to being caught up on MLW. Well, at least the pandemic has, has caught him up on his wrestling. Uh, but the podcasts and better help in general have been an escape when the movie theater isn't available. It's hard to talk to family. Some are either unavailable or talk over me as if what I say is unimportant. My mother only cares about what she wants my life to be and only reacts with confusion at what really bothers me or what I want. 
My dad half the time doesn't listen, makes a joke about what bothers me, or says what bothers me doesn't matter because my main worry should be Trump not being reelected. There is that to consider now. I must say that. But still, your problems matter and should matter more to your mom and dad. But he goes on to say, your podcasts really speak what I feel. And if you read this and you get to talk about it on the podcast, great, because better help has been a help to me. And I think I need somebody to talk to to explain to me, Brian Last, why that these fucking people supposedly in the wrestling business are ignoring the evidence in front of their eyes and better help with their mental counselors might be able to pro project me in the right direction. What do you think? I think someone needs to help you. So why <laughs> not them? A minute. What the hell kind of statement is that? Somebody needs to help you. <laughs> like it's just up for grabs. Anybody just lend him a fucking hand. He's gone off the fucking beam. Anyway, <laughs> the folks at better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours, professional counseling done securely online with a broad range of expertise. If you don't want to go out in public around people, if you don't, if you live out in the, the uh, boondocks and they don't have counselors available where you are. You can do weekly video phone sessions, no waiting rooms. Uh, better help wants you to start living a happier life today. And we've talked about it and we've had so many testimonials. So you, now you can go to better help, H E L P betterhelp.com slash drive betterhelp.com slash drive and you get 10% off your first month. And they're now they're 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 expanding. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states because so many people have been using it through the pandemic, but now you can jump in. Join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional at betterhelp.com/drive one more time just in case. You know, to go back to the previous topic, one of the things you see a lot and I believe it's probably mostly from younger fans is the idea that, well, everyone knows it's fake. Why insult our intelligence by pretending there are good guys and bad guys? But I think one of the things that misses is that the wrestling television show should be presented as something that is legitimate, not as something you're watching that you know it's not legitimate, and we're going to let you know that we know that you know it's not legitimate. We're not going to even pretend it's legitimate. It should be existing in a legitimate universe the same way any television show you watch does. Well, no, no, uh, no. On on the Avengers or all the, the movies that that same audience likes so much, all the characters on screen stop and, and say, what was that line again? Or is this where they're going to put the special effects in or whatever? And they love those movies. But that argument that, you know, oh, everyone knows it's fake. Now, get, everyone knew it was fake 25 years ago, 30 years ago. There was a small segment of the population. Well, that not everyone. But there were people willing to get into it. There were people willing to get into professional wrestling because it wasn't even the WWF. They never just said, well, we're fake. Enjoy our fake show. We'll be back with reality after this show ends. It was <laughs> we'll presented back, as... We'll be this, back with reality in a moment, but right now, let's be fake. It was presented as a, a real universe of ridiculousness at times, but it wasn't like, Ted DiBiase's not really a millionaire. He's not really meaning these things. It's just part of the show. We're trying to entertain you. Well, you know, all the, all the people now who say, well, we don't want to insult their intelligence. They got that from Vince because Vince started saying that first. We don't want to insult the fans' intelligence. Well, is it insulting their intelligence if the two people that I see on television screaming at each other that they want to choke each other are sitting together in a booth at Denny's after the match is eaten or out in the parking lot screaming at each other, I'll fucking kill you at Denny's after the matches. Which one insults their intelligence? To me, it's sitting around eating fucking a goddamn moons over my hammy with each other. Well, anyway, let's get another question. These modern reps. And I don't, I don't mean to fucking malign the reputation of the moons over my hammy. This next question is a popular one. A lot of people have sent it in. 
It is sent into corny drive through gmail.com from Armin. Oh boy. <laughs> Armin. Oh boy. Smag- well, now that's, I have not heard of him before. Is this his first time writing in Armin Smajlovic? What? In Garland, Texas. Wait a minute. There's no Smajlovics in Garland, Texas. I've been there. Apparently this guy sent in an email. Here it is. Hello, Jim. I recently watched the Pat McAfee podcast and he had Adam Cole on as a special guest. Throughout the interview, Pat kept taking cheap shots at Adam to the point where Adam blew up and stormed out. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this and how is it similar to the Jerry Lawler, Andy Kaufman storyline? What are your thoughts on non-wrestling or non-wrestlers? I guess it should be working a program with top talent. Well, Pat McAfee was a football player, obviously. Well, I found out that much from watching the clip. Um, no, I'm not a big football fan, so I've not seen Pat McAfee, but I think, I think he's, uh, I think he's friends with Rip Rogers. It seems like Rip knows one of those football guys that's been on the periphery of wrestling the, here the past few years. It may be him, but anyway, um, I liked it. I, th- I think that a lot of people are like, Oh, is this real? Because they don't even see anything this convincing or anybody trying this hard, uh, you know, anymore. Obviously I've, I hate to beat around the bush and, and, and expose their business that it was a work. If, if did, are people still believing it? Am I telling them anything they don't really know? Or I was actually shocked how many people wrote to us asking if it was a work. Cause I thought it was pretty obvious what it was. Well, it, and, and once again, I don't want to, you know, take the piss out of what they did and expose their business if people are buying it, but it, it, they did a great job. Adam Cole's well-spoken. This uh, Pat McAfee, he, he reminds me of like Mongo McMichael had a fucking talk show from just getting the gist of him. Um, but they did, a, they did a good job. I, the only thing I would have tweaked was I think it, it escalated too quickly at the end. I know there was little shots back and forth and everything, but suddenly just, or maybe it was just cause I didn't think the comment was a zinger enough. I mean, you know, goddamn, if he got that mad at Pat McAfee for calling him small, Brian, I have a feeling if you ever see Adam Cole, he's going to fucking kill you. I could take Adam Cole. I'm not worried about that. Uh, but let's <laughs> see that now that right there. Would have been enough for Adam to get up. What I was saying was, well, you're on a small side. Hey, motherfucker. And that's what that's what put him over the edge. I thought that escalated a little quickly. I would have loved to have seen them, you know, either a, a sharper zinger than just you're too small or have Adam stand up and a little bit, just a little bit more, another gear in between there. But it, it, that shows what these guys can do. When they don't have a fucking writer scripting shit and telling them to memorize it and speak it. When you just say, okay, we're going to have a fucking argument. I might say this, you might say, I'll say that, you blah, 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 and they'll toss a few ideas around, and then they'll fucking go out and, and maybe when they talked about it originally, you know, maybe the small line sounded like that should be the last straw. Uh, but anyway, and fucking, I like the way that Adam fucking bowed up on everybody and stormed out of the studio. It, it got it, just the fact that you said that a bunch of people were emailing going, was this a work? People want to believe these things and they, and they don't know what to believe. And if you do them in just cause this was a different setting, they don't usually do angles, I guess on Pat McAfee's fucking football podcast or whatever. So when it's a different setting or it looks a little dirty, you could, there's ways you can make people believe things still, obviously. I mean, and, and you can make people believe almost anything. If you, the, the QAnon shit, there was just a goddamn uh, a, a news report I was watching that it, before it was such fringe shit that, you know, people didn't worry about it. And now they're actually getting to mainstream with the QAnon shit that everybody's either a fucking, you know, a child pedophile ring or a fucking lizard monster or whatever these fucking nutcases believe people want to believe stupid shit and they want to be fooled and they want to be worked and they want to believe conflict. And if you do it believably, they will ask about it. And if you don't overdo the tired old tropes, 
uh, and do it in a little different way, they they believe it even quicker. Or if you have half a goddamn lick of personality and, can, and you can make people believe that you mean what you say. It's, it's not goddamn surgery here. This is not rocket surgery or brain science. What do you think about the idea of making his size an issue? I mean, we've discussed it here on the show and opined about how Vince will react to his size once he's on the main roster, figuring he's going to be on the main roster. The idea that they're now doing this little angle where the final thing that caused him to blow up was mentioning that he's smaller <laughs> than most wrestlers. Do you think they should be playing up that he's well, smaller? Uh, I mean, I don't remember. I mean, we haven't seen everything with NXT, but we've seen a lot over the last several months. I don't remember it ever being brought up on NXT TV that he was so much smaller than not necessarily Keith Lee. Well, I mean, smaller than Keith Lee, but he's smaller than most of the guys he was wrestling. Here's here's I don't know how the genesis of this. I don't know if this is something that the creative team wanted them to do, you know, or if, if uh, Pat McAfee and Adam Cole just said, hey, what if we had an argument? So if I knew the genesis of small being the, the tipping point line. I might know where else it's going to go. If it's something they just came up with, eh, nobody else is going to make mention of it on their fucking TV program. You know, it's just something to piss him off so they could do a little fucking deal. If it's actually the start of people questioning <laughs> Adam Cole's size on NXT television or any other kind of television as an ongoing professional thing, no, he needs to run as far away from that as possible. Um. It, 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 I, I tied into the watch along match we're going to do here in a little while. Uh, when I first did the interviews in Louisiana, talking about Mr. Wrestling Two being an old broke down fossil, and that old broke down fossil just let me know that he was going to be kicking a shit out of my guys on a regular basis in these matches, and maybe he, I might not call him so old. Point taken. Don't don't cut too close to the bone on your on your talent, especially baby faces, but also a, a heel uh, like Adam, don't accentuate any of his weaknesses, accentuate his strengths and ignore or minimize his weaknesses. So if it was just an argument point amongst them and it was the big football player going, hey, you're a little on the small side. Well, fuck you. Okay, that's fine. You know, but an ongoing thing, no, 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 no. Well, another hot button issue that a lot of people have sent in a question about. And I've only seen a few things about this. So I don't know. All where, the, where is this hot button? It's and, and when <laughs> who gets to push it? I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. That's a hot button question. I, I bet you, I bet you Kenny Olivier can't find the hot button. We'll see. I mean, he's pointing at it all the time. He's, he's pointing everywhere. Sooner <laughs> or later, he's going to fucking point at it. Well, a question he pointed at, at Taiwan, fucking Indonesia, and Outer Mongolia last week. A question that a lot of people have wanted to know your thoughts on is, apparently and allegedly, Tessa Blanchard refuses to return the Impact Wrestling World Heavyweight Championship unless she is given $150,000. <laughs> and from what I've read, the Impact Champion now is I think Moose, or he's the TNA champion, I'm not even sure, but they're now using a counterfeit belt from Pakistan. There's a lot of people on eBay that sell counterfeit belts from hey, Pakistan and various other places. No, let, let, me, let me tell you something. And my good friend and lifelong chum Rick Michaels down there in Atlanta, Georgia, got me a set of the NWA World Tag Team Championship belts that Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry wore uh, uh, from Pakistan. And these things are, they're the same weight, the same thickness. They're gorgeous. And, uh, and, and for like a fucking, a, a, a minute price. So do not laugh at the Pakistan belts. Before we get to this question now, since you raised this issue, I've seen these things for sale and I'm always thinking it's coming from a foreign country. They're using maybe cheaper materials. Who knows what it is? Well, I don't know what just every Tom's dick is hairy off the street gets, but with, with the guy with the N and, and me being a former manager of the champions, I got, I got a good looking set of belts. That's interesting to know, but what are your thoughts about 
Tessa My Blanchard. thoughts about Tessa Blanchard asking 150 I got it for 650 bucks a piece. So I don't know what the fuck she's selling. The only way to sell the belt itself, if you would come back and do the job, if it was a big time major league wrestling promotion that was drawing tens of thousands of fans per night and millions of people on television watching and the champion refused to come back and do the job and drop the belt unless they got 150 grand then that is that actually happened with Jeff Jarrett only he got 200 um and I can see that happening but when the champion is not going to return to drop the belt and lose in the middle of the ring. The champion is just going to FedEx the fucking belt back and it's impact wrestling, which I wouldn't exactly, you know, not even any insult to say that this is not a goddamn uh, a promotion that millions and millions of people are watching or tens of thousands of people are buying tickets to. And the belt itself, the physical belt cost them, I'm sure, less than $2,500, wherever they got it from, Pakistan or fucking Millington, Tennessee. So what the fuck does she want $150,000 for? And why don't they have another one ready? In the old days, when when it, you had to wait for Reggie Parks or Nikita Mokovich to make a fucking belt and it could take six months or a year and the promoters were cheap anyway, if if somebody made off with one of the belts, they just fucking slapped a fucking decal on something they had in the in the drawer and went on. Uh, but now, it, as easy as it is to get belts, it from a variety of places, and they ain't that much money. And she's not talking about coming back to drop it and lose in the ring and who would give a shit if she did because the fact that and I I'm a huge fan of Tessa Blanchard. Every time I've seen her work, I rank her with the Charlottes and the Rhea Ripley's and the fucking Ronda Rousey's and the Becky Lynch's that I'm enjoying. But she's, they already shit the bed on their company. A woman beat, and didn't she beat? I just read this on Twitter last. She beat Brian Cage. The same Brian Cage that's on AEW being managed by Taz, the human muscle, the fucking giant jacked up Brian Cage was defeated by Tessa Blanchard and she won the men's title. So what the fuck does it mean anyway? And maybe no wonder Brian Cage is not fucking going to get over if the target audience for him has seen her, him lose to a 140 pound woman. Well, let's be fair. No one's watching impact. So I don't know how many people right. saw that. Okay. Although All we right. can now say that AEW doesn't book him the worst that he could be possibly booked. But <laughs> So anyway, what I, I I again reiterate, there's nothing worth 150 grand here. There's nothing worth more than $2,500 here, which is that fucking belt. And truthfully, depending on how their contracts are written and whether they give a fuck, uh, they could actually fucking call the goddamn local authorities and why well, she's in Mexico. So no, no, they can't. I was going to say call the authorities and alert them to where that their stolen property is. They could go pick it up, but in Mexico, yeah, good luck with that. So I'd just buy a new belt and I'd save $147,500. Once again, though, to an issue we've discussed in the past with Tessa, does this go to her reliability? Would you? Think well, now twice that, before you book her. Now that I've heard that, um, I, I, I just, I don't know what she. I can, I can understand everything that she's done so far. Not coming back to Impact Wrestling during a pandemic, okay. Especially because she, she's living in Mexico with her boyfriend and couldn't get back into Mexico, okay. Um, there was hearsay and, uh, you know, of. of talk and suspicion over what she had said or who she had said it to. And I wasn't there and I can understand saying shit to people that you're mad at and cussing out. Uh, but well, well, it was be to be fair. It was beyond just saying shit to people you're mad at. It was bullying. It was racism. It was no, a bunch that, of different that's, things. That's, that's what I'm saying. I wasn't there so I can understand. And I said this before I can understand if she said something unsavory to somebody she was mad at cussing out in an argument with or whatever. I don't understand. I've never seen or 
uh, that type of behavior from her when I've been around her. If she said something else or did something else or was bullying and bullying's become a thing in the locker room now where people are bullying people in the locker room. Men are bullying men. Women are bullying women. Men and women are bullying each other. Fucking hell in the wrestling locker room. But anyway, the point is I can't fucking get behind this one. This may be the tipping point where I say, okay, Tessa may have something going on. If that's an honest offer that came out of, or even a dishonest one, if that came out of her mouth and anybody was supposed to take that seriously, she's got issues. That's what I'm saying. Well, you know, a lot of people think impact should hire an attorney and maybe go after Tessa. Well, I now I was about to say that there's one human being in the world that could get that belt back, but in Mexico, I'm not even sure about him. But I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, if some outlaw mud show wrestler has stolen your championship belt and will not return it for the sum of $150,000 or anything, anything less, I know exactly who you need to call to get your championship belt back. Sue their ass. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he will indeed sue their ass if they don't come across with that championship belt or whatever else that you need to make you happy. Because Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He has been representing civilians. He's been representing people in the wrestling industry. Now he's actually representing an entire town, the fine folks in Minden, West Virginia. Uh, for being poisoned and given cancer by evil major corporations fixated on greed and avarice instead of the the good of the common man. Stephen P. New can take care of these things. And I don't know, but I would think that if this uh if 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 Stephen P. New was to take this case for impact wrestling, Brian, I have a feeling that he would give Tessa Blanchard a a decent period of time to return this championship belt and otherwise what he's going to do is he's not going to come to mexico because he's not admitted in mexico he is going to summon he is going to summon the forces of lucha libre he is going to <laughs> <laughs> what he's good because i've been watching on the el rey network i've been watching some of those santo and blue demon against frankenstein and dracula and the wolfman movie he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna summon the forces of lucha libre and he's gonna have summoned the the spirit of el santo to come and take that belt back from tessa blanchard i promise right you there he, in the middle of the ring he's one guy that she can't go over that's right she she will go down on Steven rather than go over on well, Steven. No, no, let's not say that. Oh, no, oh, I don't that. No, I don't. Let's I mean, she will that. go down to defeat. That's right. At the hands of Stephen P. New, as everyone else does. Folks, if you need representation, you or your family or your loved ones have been harmed in any way by major corporations or negligence on the part of other people. Now is your chance to get even with Stephen. If you need to sue, call Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. He... Tessa Blanchard will not go down on Steve. He will, she will go down to defeat on Steven is what I was trying to say. That's right. He's no Brian cage. Yeah. He will hey, tame that Tessa. Yeah, boy. How the, f I watched Ernie Ladd work with Ricky Morton and they made it work, but I cannot imagine how the fuck that in any way that that could be made work with Tessa Blanchard versus Brian Cage and people not just fart, turn around and leave the room. Maybe that's where they all went. They farted, turned around and left the room. That's, I think that's going to be the name of the impact wrestling book. Fart, turn around and leave the room. The story of impact wrestling. <laughs> <sighs> all right. Well, let's get a few more questions before our watch along. And this is going to be a good one today. Another question that several people sent in. I'll read one here. This was sent to Corny Drive through gmail.com from Artists in Atlanta. I was wondering what your thoughts were on Cash Wheeler from FTR 
getting into a bit of a back and forth on Twitter with Mr. Jesse James, Brian Armstrong. I have included the screenshots below. Did you see this, Jim? I, I have not heard this or read about this. So I guess it started when Dax, a friend of the show, yes, tweeted out, it's Shawn Michaels' birthday. Here's a picture of the greatest wrestler to ever lace up a pair of wrestling boots. And there's a picture of Bret Hart. <laughs> More reasons to love Dax. And then Miro, the former Rusev, I believe his name is Miroslav, tweeted in response, no at, question mark, question mark. And we didn't tag Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart in that. I'm not sure if that was a joke or where he was coming from, but Brian Armstrong responded to that. No guts. Be well, Miro. God bless you, dude. At this point, Cash Wheeler Oof. jumped in and said, yeah, man, we're the ones with no guts. Definitely not you. Be well. Oh. And then Brian Armstrong responded, definitely not. Cash responded to that. Definitely a good guy that never talks shit about talent as soon as they'd walk away. And definitely wouldn't try to bury anyone that disagreed with him. Definitely. So, you can read between the lines on some of this stuff, but FTR well, apparently having some issues with the road dog, Jesse James. Well, I blame... The old Slobby. What's his name? Miroslav? Miroslav. Um, is it Miroslav Barnyashev? Is that his real name? I, I don't know if his name is Miroslav Barnshed, and I don't give a fuck. Um, here's the thing. I, it's, like, it's like two of my, my puppies are fighting with each other. I, 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 I love Cash and Dax, and I love the Armstrong family. And I've you know known Brian forever. Obviously, he was in the group with Sean I guess he's uh probably you know somehow found the the good in Sean that's buried somewhere so deep 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 down uh but <laughs> by the way he was in the group after he, Sean was he in the group with Sean or was it after Sean retired that Triple H's DX added the road dog and well yeah Billy but Gunn I mean and, they they all actually you know and they work together now you know they they're all actually you know buds or whatever Boy, they were <laughs> they weren't in Brett's group let's put it that way I think the original tweet was fucking hilarious I think he was fucking you know just doing something funny without goddamn wanting to just tweet hey Sean Michaels fuck you and here's a picture of Brett it was just a funny fucking tweet so Miroslav, who ain't involved in this in any way, shape, or form, decides to get involved and obviously raises it to the attention of Brian, who obviously has probably not been the biggest FTR fan because of whatever the fuck has gone on personally amongst them. And then he jumps in on it. If it hadn't been for, for old Slav there, I don't know that anybody would have said anything. So, I mean, you know... Uh, I, I can't disagree with the original sentiment of it's Shawn Michaels' birthday. Here's a picture of the greatest wrestler of all time. It definitely ain't Shawn. I don't know if I'd make it bread either, but it's definitely not Shawn. Uh, but I hate to see friends fight. My friends fight. Well, I will say Brian Armstrong does have a little bit of a reputation for being someone that, to the point where sometimes it seems completely ridiculous, toes the corporate line on Twitter. And he'll say when things are really bad, that things are better than they are. <laughs> and, you know, a very pro WWE way of looking at things, which is kind of the opposite of what it was when he wasn't in WWE. And he, <laughs> <laughs> and he was working in TNA and doing shoot interviews and everything. But Well, but now to be honest, to be perfectly honest, who would want to continue to still look at the, the things the way that they did when they were in TNA? <laughs> Hopefully he's had some type. He's trying to be more positive. He's trying to be positive. He wants to be positive now. Just like Sheik. He wants to be positive. He used to be positive. when That's when he was negative. Now that he's negative, he's more positive. All right. Well, our next question sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com is from Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. Oh, for, oh, for God. All right, I should have known. It's been too long. Somebody even asked if Charlie had been kidnapped by the, you know, cartel down in Char in Starkville. The cartel in Starkville. 
Well, they, they make regular visits from what we've heard from other people. Well, here's his question. Matt Hardy recently posted a video saying he'll be dropping all of his gimmicks and just be Matt Hardy from now on. What are your thoughts on Hardy giving up his teleportation and Icebox wardrobe changing powers? P.S. Tell the cult if they say my name three times in a row in front of a bathroom mirror, I will appear and ask a question that irritates them. <laughs> oh, just Charlie, 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 or do they need to know his last name? I think it has to be Charlie from Starkville. Charlie from Charlie Starkville. from Starkville. Charlie from Starkville. Charlie from Stark. Okay. Um, is this true? Is this real? Is this is this for is this for true? He's really going to just become Matt Hardy and drop all the 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 Vincent Price slash Beatrice Arthur outfit and all the other stuff. Well, here's what's sad. He did put up a video, and apparently, from what I've read, he did say this. However, he has such go home heat with me right now. I didn't watch the video, <laughs> so I don't know exactly what he said. I could try to find a transcript while we talk, but reportedly, he did in fact do a video saying that he is done with all of these gimmicks. I, which, which is a weird position which, to be in that you have to do a video to say, by the way, all these things, I'm not doing them anymore. I don't know why they thought it was a good idea for him to do them to begin with. Because just because it worked three years ago in the WWF or in Ring of a, where, where did he, where did he break him in TNA is where he got broke, right? It's where everyone gets broke. <laughs> well, that's where everyone gets broken <laughs> mentally. Is where, yeah. Um, he just made a gimmick out of it, but when when uh, I was fairly instrumental in bringing him to Ring of Honor in 2012, which not only helped our houses in those towns because he was a, a mainstream name and recognized, but also he was working as Matt Hardy and talking as Matt Hardy. And, you know, it was a help and it helped the guys that he got in the ring with to elevate them and et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I didn't watch the impact stuff because I heard that he was being teleported places and all that stuff, the whole broken universe thing. I didn't want to, as I've mentioned before, not like the Hardys because I like the Hardys. So I didn't see that stuff because I didn't want to, I specifically avoided it. The problem is it, he got, I think he got painted into a corner because it got so over with that audience. And this is a lesson. But he got so over with that, I don't even want to say the word hardcore anymore, but that closely watching devoted audience, you know the kind of audience I'm talking about, the same kind that AEW has now, only they've got a few more of them, that are into this shit so minutely and all this specific, you know, bullshit, that they wanted him to go back to the WWE with it. It wasn't going to work there because the, there it was there the shit would have to make some kind of sense at least a few years ago, and it would have to be it it just it doesn't work on that level it works on a small level but he was stuck with it so now he's been trying to resurrect it and get the rights to do it and whatever the fuck and it's already gone by does anybody give a fuck about broken Matt Hardy now it, isn't it two years ago at this point or Damascus. Or the fucking guy from 3,000 years ago, or the fucking guy with the drone may be cute. I don't know. But the whole thing is Matt Hardy, just as Matt Hardy, veteran fucking star that cut a promo like we heard him on a Twitter thing he did a, a couple of months ago, right? Or even less. I said, why, did, why didn't he just do that on television? That's the best promo he's cut. He was talking as himself. That guy is valuable. I don't know what all this silliness is with the, like I said, the fucking Beatrice Arthur robe and the fucking Bride of Frankenstein hair and the Vincent Price voiceover and what the fuck is going on. It's just, and in a place where if that was the only gimmick in a fucking straight promotion, that might even be one thing, but in a goddamn place where everybody, it's a freak show central and everybody has some outlandish gimmick or ridiculous fucking nom de plume. It's just fucking, it's just, it's a sideshow. And, and so I'm hoping that he's going to strip all that shit down. Do what Rick Rubin did with Johnny Cash. Take all the goddamn bullshit Nashville overproduction off of him and let him be a talent and do his thing. I have some quotes here. 
Here's an article from Wrestling Inc. written by, I apologize if I'm butchering this name, Cy Mohan. Starting next Wednesday night on AEW Dynamite, the professional wrestling world will see the debut of, quote, the real Matthew Hardy, according to the man himself. Hardy has portrayed a number of gimmicks over the last two decades, including his broken Matt persona and Matt Hardy version one, among many others. However, Hardy has admittedly never been his real self on camera, a side that he plans to show the fans. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. In coming days. This sounds like a work. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They've said he's never been his real self on camera. So now it's going it's to be another manufactured real self. Oh, boy. Here we go. So why is he dropping all the gimmicks? Hardy released a video on his YouTube channel to explain his decision. Quote, it is a frustrating time in America. There is so much division, chaos, racial injustice, social injustice, and we are in the midst of a killer pandemic that has killed over 140,000 Americans. To make matters worse, both political parties are trying to weaponize the chaos against one another for their own gain. Maybe it's time for me to do my part to try to heal, excuse me, to try and heal some of this division, to be a voice of reason. That is why I have decided to be real on AEW programming, to be something I have never been on TV before. It is time for me to be Matthew Hardy. Oh, boy. When I first debuted as Broken Matt Hardy in AEW on AEW Dynamite, every Wednesday was supposed to be in front of sold-out arenas. I thought thousands of people would scream, Delete! Delete! at the top of their lungs. Unfortunately, this never happened, and Broken Matt debuted in the first ever AEW Empty Arena event and has yet to perform in front of fans. That's the end of that quote. Hardy decided to change course and perform a highlight reel of his past characters, moments, and personas. However, the suspension of Sammy Guevara, who Hardy was supposed to feud with, only added to the Broken One's frustration. And now we, be- you know, I actually forgot that we haven't seen Matt Hardy since we've been doing NXT or since we've been doing uh, AEW again. No, we saw him one time. He was managing Private Party. Oh, that's right. Well, it was just like not seeing him. And here's a quote: One of the coolest things about AEW is its passionate fan base. Not being able to interact with fans, and then Sammy Guevara getting suspended only led to more frustration. Hardy has not wrestled on AEW Dynamite since his victory over Santana on June 24th. In recent episodes, he has served as an on-air mentor to Private Party and accompanied them to the ring. So there's the story, although it sounds like it's just going to be another character, the real Matthew Hardy. Yeah, yeah. uh, well, I get what, what, what could he have come out and said, you know, I did some really stupid things with myself. Uh, the last couple of years I've, I've fucking changed. I teleported from another dimension in an ice machine and disappeared from under the fucking pool water and came. I, I I don't know. I just, it used to be a rule of thumb that when you switched back from baby face to heel or vice versa or back and forth too much, it would completely bury you and you'd be meaningless. And you'd have to leave the territory and and be gone for a while so people would forget. I don't know what to say about uh, not just switching back and forth from heel to babyface, but actually switching back and forth from person to person. Uh, Like he's all these different people. I don't... I don't know. I like the I like the guy under there somewhere. Hopefully it'll just be Matt Hardy experienced veteran wrestler, former WWE megastar who people have loved for years, North Carolina's favorite son. But you know, that's hoping against hope. You know what? You know what? I wish Brian, I wish that there was some way that I could just block all this chatter out. All these people saying all these stupid things. If there was something I could just stick in my ears and just Cancel out all that outside world noise, whether it be about pandemics or political parties or pro wrestling, and just listen to what I want to listen to. Happy music, inspirational words, something that 
that will help me that I can just go into my own world and, and shut the outside world out and not have to listen to all that. Do you have any idea what something like that could be? Absolutely. I could recommend something to you right now. Raycon. Raycon? Raycon. Well, why didn't I think of that to begin with? The wireless earbud people, Raycon? Not Tony Khan, Raycon. That's right, and Ray is not even related to Tony Khan. Raycon is the folks that make those fine, fine, sweet wireless earbuds, <laughs> including the newest model. <laughs> what? what? You saying sweet just popped me up. Sweet, <laughs> sweet wireless earbuds, including... Their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, they're so comfortable, you can put them in every day. And Lord knows, I love shit that you can stick in every day. They've got six hours of playtime, oh. seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise-isolating fit. Raycon's wireless earbuds are so comfortable that you won't even notice you're wearing them. They're perfect for conference calls, binging on our podcast. They keep the sound out. They're stylish and discreet. No dangling wires or stems. No things sticking out of your head to make you look like Ray Walston and my favorite Martian. And now you can not only get the excellent wireless earbuds from Raycon, but you can save money too. 15% off this, this folks. 15% off. Buyraycon.com, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com, slash J-C-E, 15% off the wireless earbuds that sound better than just any other goddamn thing you'll hear. That's how I'm going to keep all this chatter out. A lot of people listen to this show using their Raycon earbuds. Yeah, keep the outside chatter out and keep the inside chatter in. Keep our chatter in and everybody else's chatter out. Let's get some more chatter here on the you show. You know, I used, to, I used to, as a matter of fact, I used to know a guy named Peter. And I can't remember the way that that, the fucking punchline, the joke goes. I'll come back to that. <laughs> what, it was you, something. You he can't just my, leave that there. Well, no, wait a minute. I'm trying to remember because it's a rhyme. It's a, he, he showed me the meaning of true friendship because some friends... Some friends may come and go, but he'll be your friend, Peter out or Peter in. I can't remember exactly how that gets set up. Anyway. Right now, the cult are ripping their Raycon earbuds out of their ears. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but a few more questions here, Jim. This was sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Brian in Brenham, Texas. I ran across an article today stating that Jacob Fatu has signed with MLW through 2025. I hate the fact that a guy I consider one of the best in the business will not have the opportunity to be on national television for another five years. However, I understand his thinking. When your other choices are WWE, a.k.a. Mr. McMahon's world of make-believe, or the bipolar AEW, who can't seem to decide if they are booking professional wrestling or a backyard circle jerk, you can see why he chose to stick with MLW. Still, people are desperate for sports right now, and to me, Jacob Fatu and a handful of others could lead a resurgence in professional wrestling. Do you think he will ever get the chance to show the world what he can do? Oh, not at this rate. Um, and no, and I, I appreciate Court Bauer's contract negotiating skills on this one. Uh, <sighs> I don't know. I don't know why that Fatu would sign, and I'm not knocking anybody here, but I don't know why he'd sign anything for five years right now with anybody because so much has changed and so much is up in the air. Um, I honestly don't know why that the WWF passed, if there's any issues with the old deal where when they had bam bam bigelow or a few other people he can't go to canada that was a code word for he's got some stuff on his record if i could jump in for a moment here uh two things before you go on one okay. is i think we have seen if someone needs to get out of an mlw contract it could happen but well, secondly most importantly and i want to be careful how i say this because i don't want to give up who said it to me but someone with 
knowledge of the way management is handling things in WWE told me that Jacob Fatu was not signed because of his criminal record. And it was the same reason the Briscoe brothers weren't signed to WWE, that it was specifically about their criminal records. And I was told this by someone Again, I want but to now, be very but careful. Now, but now, well, wait a minute. Now, when we say that, the criminal records, uh, neither one of them's um, goddamn murdered anybody. Uh, we're talking, uh, at least I have firsthand knowledge of the Briscoe brothers, of some, a few assaults, them boys, um, Sandy Fork, a few assaults and things of that level. I don't know about Jacob Fatu's specifically, however... Tim Booker T goddamn served time in prison for armed robbery. I believe so. Yeah. Did MVP not serve years in prison for armed robbery? I believe so. Bam Bam Bigelow couldn't go to Canada as they used to say back in those days. So finish your thought if you weren't already, but I didn't want to leave it their criminal record. Like, my God, these guys robbed a bank somewhere. Yeah, and I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying I was told with someone with extreme knowledge of the thinking of management in WWE that this was the exact reason why Jacob Fatu and also the Briscoe brothers, who have worlds of talent, we're never signed by WWE. I, was- I don't I don't believe you because I don't think anybody has extreme knowledge of the inside work that blah, 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 as you just mentioned. But I, I, it just it I don't know the per, the particulars of the deal. I'm happy that Fatu's happy in MLW. I'm happy at court signed him. I don't know why you'd sign for five years a guy with that talent anywhere. I I I don't care about his in Unless, unless for he's too young to have served enough time to justify the the offense that he shouldn't be in the WWE. If he if he did something bad enough that they shouldn't sign him, as talented as he is, and in this fucking day and age, then he should still be in prison for it. Uh, and I don't think that's the case. That doesn't explain what explains AEW is uh, Jacob Fatu's from California. So are the Young Bucks and the guy they used to hang out with until. Everybody found out he was an asshole. And I guarantee you that Jacob Fatu never agreed to grab the other guy's fucking crotch or fucking get knocked out by the little middle schoolers super kicks is why he's not in AEW. But I'm just telling you that guy's a major fucking talent with a manager that knew what the fuck he was doing. And I'm not auditioning for the fucking part. He can talk a little bit, but he needs a manager because you need to hear from a guy like that as little as possible and only when it means something. And he can do everything in the fucking ring and you can put believability into him. And maybe he will be on on national TV. Maybe MLW will be on national TV. But uh, I'm surprised he locked himself into one place in today's environment for five whole years. This question was sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Sean in Perth, Western Australia. Hey, Jim. Why is hey, every, Sean. Why is every second tag team an express? Midnight, <laughs> rock and roll, can am, Jurassic, all night, etc. The dictionary definition is verb to show, manifest, or reveal. Or to put through <laughs> to put thought into words adjective clearly indicated or stated noun fast train or fast way of sending freight i suspect something to do with the latter cheers in advance so jim why are there so many expresses oh god because of the midnight and rock and roll um specifically because of the midnight the first version Obviously, everybody knows the Midnight Express was a movie in 1978, and the the Midnight Express was the, you know, the Underground Express, the Underground Railway. It was a drug fucking pipeline, blah, 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 right? Kid goes to jail in a Turkish prison. Have you, have you ever been to a Turkish prison, Brian? Have you ever seen a grown man naked? I have anyway, not. Uh, you've not seen a grown man naked? Well, there you go. <laughs> You're doing lines from airplane now. I'm doing lines from airplane now. Yeah, that's the seriousness of this. But anyway, 
And Dennis Condry and Randy Rose and Norvell Austin had the idea to call their tag team the Midnight Express two years after the movie came out. Um, you know, for whatever reason, when they thought of it, when they were driving up and down the road in the car in Continental Wrestling in Southeastern, whatever it was called then, in Alabama. And then they used it in Memphis, the Midnight Express. Well, then, depending on who you want to believe, Jimmy Hart or Jerry Lawler, one of those two men, I believe it was Jimmy Hart, but you never know about these things. But anyway, and Jimmy Hart believes it was Jimmy Hart. Riggy Morton and Robert Gibson, two good-looking underneath baby faces that had grown up in, in the Memphis Territory. Robert had been working there from the time he was 18 with his older brother, Ricky. Um, Riggy Morton had been there since he first broke into business, and he'd been around for a while. His father, Paul, had worked the territory for 30 years. So putting them together as a tag team wasn't a revolutionary thought or concept, but because the fabulous ones were on top, Stan Lane and Steve Kern, the Rock, Ricky and Robert were going to be kind of an underneath babyface team, and but they could be used as on the main event, the spot shows when, you know, if, if there's another town running, when Louisville runs on Tuesday night, if we're in water Valley, Mississippi, put Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson in the main event. Well, they got to have a gimmick, a tag team, you know, gimmick of some kind. And Jimmy says he suggested the bandanas and the MTV style look. Cause remember MTV came on the air in what late 81. This is early 83. It was still new. Um, so Jimmy said, may, you know, put the bandanas in on them and the, the, you know, the spandex and the rock and roll express. Okay. That pretty much was the extent of the expresses until we went to Louisiana. And then when, you know, we started drawing so much money and doing the business and other territories started hearing about it. Well, then other expresses came along and there was the, then even in the same territories after the rock and roll express had been in Louisiana, <laughs> then another tag team came from Memphis, Coco Ware and Norvell Austin, the PYT express instead of rock and roll. They were dressed up like Michael Jackson, PYT pretty young thing with the gloves and the fucking hair and the fucking leather zipper, red jackets, the PYT express. And then, um, it, it, there were some other offshoots that weren't expressed. Mike Davis and Tommy Lane became the rock and roll RPMs. For those of you who still remember records, that's revolutions per minute. Um, I remember Nick Goulas when he was running spot shows in the, in the, actually it may have been George in the late eighties around Huntsville and some parts of small towns of Tennessee, Tommy Hagee. It was a local guy used to work for Goulas and some, I think it was Mike Jackson were the stop and go express. Bobby Eaton loved that. He, that tickled him. He said, it sounds like they're a convenience store, the <laughs> stop and go express. What is it? And then Brad Armstrong and Tim Horner became the lightning express because they moved so quick and you were the Can-Am express. Cause one was from Canada and one was from America, but it all came from. And then when, when, when we went to Crockett, that was even much bigger because now rock and roll and midnight are both on national TV. So there was an express every fucking where, and it, you know, it just, that's what you, that's what you did in wrestling or anything else. You know, you, when something worked, you beat it up and prostitute it until it doesn't, you know, and that's what everybody did. Okay. We have time for one or two more questions. This one sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. From Curtis Deerling in Missouri. I went to the Harley Race Wrestling Academy and worked for Harley for a number of years. There was a story that in the 70s or 80s, Harley was pulled over for speeding. When the highway patrol officer went up to the window, he recognized Harley. The officer said, Harley, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> With beer cans everywhere and a naked little person on his lap, Harley <laughs> said, what does it look like? I'm fucking. Have you heard this story before and is it legit? Well, no, I hadn't heard that particular one and I can't say for sure. And it, it very well may be. Um, we must, we must say that uh, it's not 
mentioned in this telling of the tale, but I believe the, the little person was a female, was it not? I um, believe so. I, which yeah. helps, which helps the story a little bit. Uh, no, Harley race was noted for driving a hundred miles an hour everywhere and for nonstop, you know, drinking a beer out of one hand, smoking a cigarette out of the other hand and driving a hundred miles an hour and getting everywhere and always being the one to insist on driving. And you had to be, you couldn't be faint of heart to, to hang with Harley while he was driving in a car, but he, you know, he knew how to get everywhere. As well, there was a story I heard from a guy that used to work with him at his training camp there later on. He was in a, he was in the back seat. They were driving him and Harley was in the back seat. This was in later days here. And, uh, he was looking at the road Atlas. He, Harley's an old timer. I'm sure he has one and had one in his car till the day he died. Uh, and he starts laughing and they said, well, what, what's so funny, Harley? He said, I was just looking. I figured I've gotten in a fight in every town within 50 miles of here. And he was telling the truth. You know, it, it, it I can't specifically say that that specific story was true. It probably was or something else. Maybe he was fucking the, the midget one time and, and had the beer cans and they fell out of the door, you know, when the, when he opened the door for the cop the other time, or maybe they conflated the stories or whatever, but Harley did some fucking ridiculous shit and who's going to tell him not to it's fucking Harley race. And he should have died five times. Right. So he was, you know, he, he had the car wreck when he first got into business, should have died, killed his wife, didn't it? Um, he had that intestinal surgery from doing the splash and the table leg rupturing his abdomen. Uh, he had the boat wreck and a car wreck. Uh, it had pins put in his shit. Um, the injury in the match with Hogan, the abdominal injury. Yeah, well, that that's where he, the, the table, yeah. he caught the, the table leg. Yes, I mentioned that. And there was the bisque. I mentioned the bisque. See, that's a, that's a Seinfeld line. <laughs> you got it. Very good. I mentioned the bisque. I know my Seinfeld. Um, but anyway, so, I mean, yeah, it, it, anything is, is possible. I've told you before, I was sitting in the locker room in Greensboro one time when he came in to do a special appearance. And he was kind of, you know, limbering his leg up and, you know, putting his tights and lacing his boots on and everything. I, and I don't even know how it came up. I probably said something about God, Harley, you got to feel all those bumps. You'd be like, come here, kid. And he took my hand and he put his elbows and his knees felt like bean bags. His kneecaps were not in one piece and his ends of his elbows were not, they were just, they were like a bean bag. It was just pieces of shit. And I don't know how that he could still do the shit that he could do, but you know, that's why everybody talks about Harley being the toughest guy, not only because Harley could fight, which he could, um, but he was the toughest guy in the world, not that he could whip every single human being, but that, you know, he would just so tough, resilient, the meaning of the word tough. And how do you hurt this fucking guy? And and can he get through anything? And, you know, or the, the, the guys like when Danny Hodge had his car wreck and fucking broke his neck and ended up in the goddamn you know, in the bayou beside the road and had to swim out of the water and walk, what, two or three miles to a farmhouse while holding his broken neck with one fucking arm so that his head would be stabilized. He swam out of the bayou, walked three miles in the middle of the night in the dark. To, who fucking does that shit? So all those guys, you know, they did whatever the fuck they wanted to. I've heard some stories about Hodge, too. I heard some stories about Hodge one night from this lady in Little Rock who was apparently one of his ardent admirers, and he, he it got over with me even more, some of his personal habits. Are you going to expand upon that? Absolutely not. He'll still kick your ass. He would sit. No, he'd be, he'd be, well, I guess he'd probably not want it bandied about in public, but he'd probably be proud of it. But what? we won't go there. Oh, okay. Huh? Okay. Huh? What? Pr I was going to say proud of your ass. I, it took me a no, second to realize what you were. Proud of the story being told in pub. In he wouldn't. He he might not want the story told in public, but he would be proud of people knowing the story at the same time. At least he'd have been proud of the boys knowing the story. A lot of the boys knew a lot of Hodge stories. 
But use your imagination, folks. Our final there question this week on the drive through sent to corny drive through gmail.com. I see a real name here, but it is signed Dick from Dickville, Mississippi. <laughs> Obviously, Charlie from Starkville has Midnight Express like influence now over the other people sending in their emails. Longtime listener and fan of the show here. I read years ago a story of Brutus the Barber Beefcake arriving at WrestleMania 5 in Atlantic City on the day of the show with a stripper in tow that he allegedly met the night before, insisting that she needed to be given a ticket to the show. The author claimed Brutus's request was delivered upon, and his lady friend was given tickets to the show. Was this something you ever experienced in wrestling? What? Perhaps you yourself took advantage of such things. I know a lot of the boys were popular with the ladies. Was it common for guys to turn up with a friend or two and request they be granted free access to the show? This is a rib question, right? Similarly, did you get a lot of freeloaders backstage at shows? Were there any wrestlers who were notorious or well-known for bringing friends to shows and trying to get them into shows for free? And if so, how much hospitality would be extended? So wait a minute. Basically, the overall question here is, have, has any other wrestler besides Brutus Beefcake ever brought a girl, a rat, or their friends and family and wanted to get them free tickets? Uh, the actual subject line is freeloaders and freebies. So I think how many wrestling shows have ever been run in history? Whatever that number is, that's the same number of wrestlers that have tried to get free fucking tickets for strippers, whores, rats, girlfriends, family members, friends, business associates, and fucking uh, drug suppliers. Constantly. All the time. Now, you, there was times you knew when not to do it. Nobody better ask goddamn. If you asked Bill Watts for a ticket for anybody, he would get it to you and make sure that the fucking cost of that ticket was taken out of your goddamn salary. If you brought your wife or your girlfriend or your family to the fucking matches, he would have a fucking meeting at TV and say the chairman of Exxon doesn't bring his wife to the board meetings. If it was the Superdome, he'd lighten up, and because they had a skybox, I actually did. The only time I ever asked for a free ticket from Mid-South Wrestling was my first Superdome when Mama Cornette came down from Louisville and my girlfriend at the time, and they sat up in the fucking box uh, because they were afraid to put them down on the floor because if anybody found out it was Mama Cornette, they were afraid she'd be killed. Um... And, you know, sometimes if a guy's over and he's drawing money in the territory, Jerry Jarrett was never going to tell Jerry Lawler, no, you can't have fucking, you know, five of your friends come to the matches in Memphis for free. But he sure would have told me, no, you can't have five of your friends come to the matches in fucking Louisville. So it depended on who it was, uh, depended on the circumstances. But as to whether people got away with it or not, or whether they... You know, some even I'm sure people guys still had the balls to ask Watts or they'd ask Grizzly or they'd just try to sneak some girl in and stick her in the fucking bleachers and, and you know, hope that Grizzly wouldn't see it, which Grizzly saw everything. Um, And sometimes, you know, some promoters didn't give a shit. OK, if it's your girlfriend or if it's your, if it, you know, the, like the Virginia wives in the Carolinas, all the guys that lived in Charlotte had what they called their Virginia wives. When you went up every couple of weeks to Norfolk and Richmond, you stayed over a couple of days. So they, they had their specific, they, they were okay most of the time. And plus when you're drawing six, seven, eight thousand, ten thousand people, a few tickets here and there doesn't really make a big difference. But I remember also hearing that the comp ticket list for Starcade 86 in Greensboro at the Coliseum they gave out somewhere in the neighborhood of, of three dozen, 36 comp tickets. The WWE people, when they did the, the pay-per-view there in, in 1998, were gobsmacked. They'd never seen that small a comp ticket list. It was probably all for the radio stations and, you know, fucking some very high-placed people because they just didn't give tickets away in those days. But at the same time for Starcade. 
a lot of the guys would bring their wives and they'd either stick them in the end of the bleachers or they'd just pull out a fucking folding chair and have them sit if the place was sold out because that's where you'd really get heat. We're sold out. We're turning fans away, but I've parked your wife's ass in a chair for free. Fuck you. I'm paying you too. So it depends. Who was the, no, who, they, <laughs> who's the worst offender in Smoky Mountain? Oh, God. Um, <sighs> I'm trying to think. I can't remember a lot of guys abusing that. It's, you know, honestly, I don't remember anybody abusing uh, comps in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I really can't think. And and plus, it, sometimes it depended. You know, if uh, if Morristown East High Principal Jerry Williams was in a tag on the show, you know, with Horner against me and fucking... Stan Lane, well, I bet you that Jerry didn't charge 10 or 20 of his fucking family members to come in and see him, but we drew fucking almost a thousand people to see it. So what the fuck, right? I, you know, I can't remember because they knew you just don't do that. And I, plus I, I was the last one telling anybody they couldn't bring a, their own fucking particular, uh, girlfriend in that area whatever area we were in. So, if, you know, I'd, I'd be glad to let one girl in free with each guy <laughs> just to make sure everybody was happy. Was it the same thing in OVW? Cause now you're talking more about guys being trained. Oh no, nobody fucking no. It, it less, well, if you were on the show or working on the show, that's one thing, but nobody just fucking got in. And that's that, that was over my head too. That was Danny Davis and everybody was too scared of Danny to try to fucking wangle any goddamn freebies. Uh, and, and you know, and, and once again, this is in the building. We're not talking about in the locker room, none of these girls, none of these wives, none of these fiancés, none of these friends, none of these business partners, nobody was allowed in any of the locker rooms just cause you could get in the building free and see the fucking show didn't mean you were in the back, the locker room, the back area adjacent to the locker room or anything, you know, fucking where the, it's supposed to be the boys exclusively. And again, then there's exceptions to that old general MacArthur, Bruce MacArthur up in Chicago. He part owner of the hockey team. And he had a, you know, uh, the, he would take the horsemen out all the time, limos and planes and things. So he might be standing around back of the UIC pavilion, but even he didn't go in the locker room. So it, you know, but yeah, no, that's just, we're just talking about getting free into the building. That was hard enough. Nobody went in the locker room in almost, I can't, I can't remember a territory that I was ever in where anybody, even really the cops doing security unless they were personal friends with the boys were ever allowed in the locker room, much less any fans, any friends, blah, blah, blah. That's a modern invention. Last 25 or 30 years. Well, Jim, that's it for the questions this week. We'll see how we're doing with time. Maybe we'll get a song or two, but right now it's time for another watch along. And this is one I'm really excited about because the Midnight Express Houston, Texas matches from 1984 are all amazing. And this is, Really one of the, I guess this is really the first high profile match you guys had in Houston. Yes, it was. As a matter of fact, the, and, and Houston was a great place to work because the town, Paul Bosch had really taken good care of that town. The people loved wrestling. They were hot. They were wild. They saw the TV. They knew what was going on. It was a great building for wrestling. So we let, and also, um, with the exception of the big Oklahoma city houses and the Superdome shows, this was our big payoff. Um, Houston was the best town consecutively for year consecutively. The Houston was the best town usually for, uh, houses and payoffs. And it had been that way on and off most of the time through the whole history of the Texas territory. But in this particular instance, uh, Bill Dundee had started his booker in December of 83, all the Houston or all the, uh, Memphis crew, Myself, the Midnight, Rock and Roll, Terry Taylor, Buddy Landell had come down and started at the end of the year. But Houston was still a, uh, a, a kind of a standalone city and that Paul Bosch still had influence. He still brought in Bockwinkle, who owned part of the town still at this point. We've told that story before. Nick Bockwinkle had bought into Houston. He wanted to retire there and take over from Bosch running the town. Unfortunately, the changes in the 
wrestling business. By the time that he retired, there was no town of Houston to run. Plus, around the time he bought in, Bill Watts bought in. So now you didn't just have yeah. Peter Burkholz and Paul Bosch as your partners. It was Peter, Paul, Nick, and Bill Watts. Peter, Paul, and I wish they'd have had a partner named Mary. That would have been classic. <laughs> but um, this was still at the point where Paul was bringing in a uh, talent that, as he always had done, that was specific to Houston. Uh, you mentioned uh, we worked on a show with Black Gordman and the Great Goliath there early on. Uh, Bockwinkle was still defending the AWA title on some of these shows. Tito Santana uh, was a, a, a Paul liked to bring in guys that appealed to the Hispanic audience in Houston that didn't work the rest of the territory. That's one of the reasons why JYD was so over in Houston before Watts even bought in and brought the Mid-South talent over because – Paul had been bringing JYD in to Houston just to do shots. So anyway, um, having said that, business was down everywhere in the Mid-South Territory at the end of 83. That's why Watts had, had done the talent trade with Jarrett and come to Memphis looking for new talent. That's why they changed the bookers. That's why he had uh, uh, you know, done all this that he had done to later on in the year make – Houston, a more Mid-South town. Paul didn't bring in as many outside talents going forward as he had in the past. And part of the reason was because in 84, we did such huge business with the regular Mid-South crew. He didn't need to. Um, the two biggest gates in the Sam Houston Coliseum history of Paul Bosch's promotion were both drawn in 1984 and the Midnight Express were in the main event of both of them. So, Business had been down the the house December 30th, 1983 with Bockwinkle versus Wrestling 2 for the AWA title in the main event. The house was only $29,000. And for Houston to be doing, and that's, in those days, that's around 4,000 people at those ticket prices. But that was not good for Houston. So when we started, they flew us in to do a TV taping the day before Thanksgiving, 1983, we did two matches, two weeks of TV. Two weeks later, they flew us down to Shreveport and we did three more matches, which was three weeks of TV counting the special holiday episode they were doing. And then we started the territory full time and we made two appearances in Houston on the underneath cards to get wins. So, when we finally got a main event, which was with Wrestling 2 and Magnum TA, who were the Mid-South Tag Team Champions at the time, but this was a non-title match. And the reason was because we were milking the idea since the Midnight Express were unheard of in Mid-South Wrestling. The people of Mid-South and Houston, Texas had never heard of Jim Cornette, Dennis Condry, or Bobby Eaton until they saw us on Mid-South TV around Thanksgiving. <laughs> We had five weeks of wins on television. And then we came to Houston and we had two shows where we won underneath matches. And we needed to prove ourselves, according to Wrestling 2 and Magnum TA, before they'd give us a title shot. So that was the way that they were building this to where finally we would embarrass them. We kept calling them chickens, saying they were chickens not defending it, not defending the titles against us. <clears throat> we would finally, after this match, we're going to watch in the middle of February, do an angle on TV where we tarred and feathered Magnum TA. Actually, it was, it was Cairo syrup and feathers from a pillow. But we feathered him because he was a chicken, and that forced them to have to defend the tag team titles against us. So, yes, we did do four shows in Houston. The first match, this one, did $51,000 between six and 7,000 people. Two weeks later, we were back at this one. I'll give you the finish ahead of time. They get disqualified. <clears throat> the baby faces. Then two weeks later, we came back in another non-title match. And that was when we got disqualified for throwing powder in wrestling two's eyes and then almost started a riot by getting heat on both of them. And Paul Bosch had to come out and tell me to get the fuck out of there. Then we came back two weeks later and had another match where this time, uh, I believe it was no disqualification and it was non-title and we beat them. And then we had a fourth match, which was for the title and they slipped over us. And then the, the, the 
turn was done where two walked out on TA when we won the belts from them in Lafayette, Louisiana, and they never got any more rematches. But for those series of matches in Houston, we did between fifty and sixty thousand dollars, which had basically doubled the business that they were at two months previously. And in two months' time from that, we would do the last stampede match where we did over a hundred thousand dollars and the biggest crowd that ever saw wrestling in the Sam Houston Coliseum. So this was part of the building of the business overall from where it had been the change of the talent. Watts's uh, old crew moved some guys out, got some new blood in. And this is what I mean when I say you can get guys with talent over if you present them the right way. <clears throat> and they had never seen us in Houston past, like I said, the five weeks of TV and then another couple weeks on TV while we were starting the angle with two and TA. We got a little bit of heat on them in one TV segment. This is why they jump us. They they come in the ring and jumpstart us on this one because they were mad at what we'd done to them on TV. And the people in Houston wanted to kill us because I had been talking them over and they'd been beating people. And that's how you get new talent over. They come in, they beat somebody on TV every week and their manager or themselves, if they talk for themselves, tells the people how great they are. And then you pull the trigger on an angle where you put them in with guys that are already established main event talent and you theoretically sell tickets to that. That's exactly what we did here. And it's not like we had, as I said, a long history in Houston because they'd never seen us before the fucking Thanksgiving and this is the end of January. And we've just jumped the house $20,000 from what it was two months before. So what was the card that night? Brian, you've got that in front of you. What was the entire card this particular night of this match we're going to watch? I do have the card, but quickly, let me just mention you were in Houston twice before this. December 30th, 1983. The Midnight Express defeated Lanny Poffo and Rick Rude. Yep. And then January 13th, 1984, the Midnight Express defeated Lanny Poffo and El Bracero. So those were the two matches in Houston. El Bracero was a guy named Jose Martinez. And I couldn't believe that we were wrestling him because he was a job guy when I started watching Bruiser's TV show in Indianapolis. Bruiser always, Indianapolis had a huge Hispanic population even back then and he always used uh hispanic wrestlers underneath uh in preliminary matches including blackie guzman i don't know how he ended up there but blackie guzman i think it was the same one the fucking huge lucha heel by the 1970s was an old broken down mexican guy doing preliminary matches in indianapolis um, so I'd seen Jose Martinez, El Bracero on TV and all, we show up in Houston and we're wrestling him. I'm like, what the fuck? What is this? Uh, but that was, it, it, Paul always wanted to put extra Hispanic guys on the card in Houston to draw. And he was still doing that until, as I said, when this business took off, he just went completely with the entire Mid-South crew. He didn't need to bring anybody else in because they were doing record business. Here is the card. January 27th, 1984, the Sam Houston Coliseum, Houston, Texas. Masao Ito defeated John King. Masao Ito was about to leave for, for Memphis. That was one of the guys that Jarrett got in the trade, along with Rick Rude and Jim Neidhart and Hacksaw Higgins. John King didn't go anywhere else. Poor fella. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Adias defeated Hacksaw Higgins. Adias was on loan from Dallas, and uh, Hacksaw Higgins was about to go to Memphis. Terry Taylor defeated Tom Lintz. Tom Lintz was a big, bald-headed guy, nice guy. They used him underneath there. He was, you know, good, big, athletic, rugged-looking guy, but he was just there to put Terry over because Terry was just starting like we were. A battle of the former tag team champions, Jim Neidhart defeated Butch Reed via disqualification. And this one... Neidhart and Butch had been the tag team champions, as you said, and then Neidhart uh, switched he or switched babyface on Butch. They broke up, and the rib was in those days when you did an angle in Shreveport on TV. It took five weeks for that show to go completely all around the territory. 
because one week the TV show would air in New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Biloxi, and the next week it might air in Lake Charles and Lafayette and Houston, and the next week it might air in Little Rock and Greenville, Mississippi and Jackson, Mississippi, and finally by the time it got to Oklahoma, it was five weeks, because that way you could always have your house show right in the town, right behind your hot angle on TV, right? It was staggered all around. So anyway, poor Neidhart, because Watts was such a stickler, it had been done. He and Butch had split up. Neidhart had become a baby face, but it hadn't shown all over the territory yet. So since it had happened, Watts wasn't going to pretend like it hadn't happened as far as kayfabe was concerned. So Neidhart couldn't dress with the baby faces because the people in, in different towns hadn't seen him switch baby face, but he couldn't dress with the heels because it had taken place that he and Butch were mad at each other. So Houston was one of the towns that for a period of about three weeks, Neidhart had to dress in broom closets. He had broom closets, fucking audio rooms, wherever they had an extra room. Nightheart was all alone. It was like he was in solitary because he couldn't be with the, the heels because they had broken up, but he couldn't be with the baby faces because the people hadn't seen it on TV and they wouldn't understand it. Also on this show, Jose Lothario defeated Black Gordman. Uh, and Jose was huge in San Antonio and uh, in San Antonio and Houston, uh, even though he was from San Antonio. And that's another uh, guy Paul used to like to bring in because he'd been huge at a drawing card in Houston for 20 years. Also on the show, besides the Midnight Express versus Magnum TA and Mr. Wrestling 2, the main event, a loser leaves town elimination match. Crusher Darso, Butch Reed, and Nikolai Volkov, Butch Reed wrestling twice on this show, defeated the Junkyard Dog, Tito Santana, and the loser who has to leave town, Hacksaw Duggan. Well, and that didn't last long. <laughs> I can't even remember how they got out of that. How did they get out of that? I don't remember. Because Tito never came back. <laughs> there was another <laughs> Tito. Paul brought Tito in. They liked Tito, but they didn't need Tito anymore. I don't know how they did that. Well, anyway. Yeah, I'm looking at the you, results here. Hacksaw Duggan's not on Houston shows for... I'm trying to see when he returns. Looks like he returns in April. You know what? I'm trying to remember. Did they do a deal where they sent him over to the... Well, Dog went to the Carolinas when he became Stagger Lee. He went to the Carolinas for six weeks. They may have done... Or did Duggan go to Florida at that point for for shots? I can't remember. Anyway, we're not talking about Duggan today. We're talking about us. The point is, as you can see, this was kind of the match that had some heat and had, you know, the people's attention and we were programming going forward. The other matches were kind of cleaning up some of the talent that was leaving and changing the, the pairings and everything. And uh, as I said, January 27, 1984, the house was $51,000. That's between six and 7,000 people. And because we had already pissed them off on television, uh, the baby faces hit the ring hot and jump start us. And, uh, and I have not watched this thing all the way through probably since it happened. So, and we're going to do it right here, right here in front of God and everybody right here today. Well, the video is entitled midnight express with Jim Cornette in parentheses versus Magnum TA and Mr. Wrestling Two. Now, in parentheses, it says rematch. It is, in fact, not a rematch. It is the first match from Houston, correct? Well, it's the first match from Houston. We had actually wrestled them in other towns, so it, technically it was a rematch. But a, a lot of these Houston matches that are on YouTube were put up at different times by different people, and people have lost track of the. Some are real dates and some aren't. Some are in odd order, like the uh, second match comes for the first, etc. So, But this is the first match between these two teams in the city of Houston, Texas in 1984. The uploader of the video is Rob D. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a video with the title that I listed before, and the account would be the Rob D account. Congratulations, Rob, on getting <laughs> Congratulations, the Congratulations, Rob. Yeah. Most people don't like our rub usually. 
Well, speak for yourself, Mr. Yeah, Kramer. Right. But, but anyway, what we're going to do is what we always do. Go to this video, press pause on zero, zero, zero. Hopefully you're able to. And, and then hopefully we can tweet out a link or something to this also to help people along. Absolutely. This will be easy to do that for. And what we'll do is a five second countdown. We will count down from five. After one, I will say play now, press play now. At that point, press play, and that's it. We'll kick it off right there. Jim, are you ready from your end? I'll be ready. Ladies and gentlemen, please pause the video and get ready. Five, four, three, two, one. Press play now. And boom, here we go. They've just hit the ring. The announcer jumping out. Look at the fire wrestling two hat. And Dennis, this was Dennis' thing. He loved taking bumps in the robes because he thought it looked so fucking exciting, right? So the baby faces hit the ring. The only thing I miss on these, and you got to go back and watch it, folks, with the crowd audio up. We can't do it for this purpose, but the people were so hot and they just were into everything. But anyway, so chaos reigns as the baby faces are fucking kicking ass. Wrestling two, once we won the belts, two shot Dennis off. Uh, with the robe thing going on one night and gut shot at him. He had the belt on too, almost broke his fucking knuckles. Alice Marie Nelson, the photographer I'm hiding behind there. Bruce Pritchard is probably somewhere around ringside. The ring announcer was Cleet Dumpster, local radio <laughs> personality. Cleet Dumpster. Carl Fergie, cousin Carl is the referee. And look at Bobby. That was already like whenever he, he was going to start getting juice every night. So he would do the thing. Where when you hit him in the head, that was like a fucking nervous tick of his. So when he had to get juice, you didn't notice it. Magnum went to shoot him off, but Dennis was in the way. So Bobby put the brakes on. This was called completely in the ring because we were in separate locker rooms. So in Houston, you never saw the baby faces till you got in the ring. So everything except the finish was called in the ring and... The finishes were given, but Bill Dundee was the booker, so he would come over and he'd give you the finish verbally in each locker room. So you heard it from the same guy, but you heard it at different times. This is January 27th. How many times had you guys worked already with T.A. and Tui? You, were, you guys were already working uh, together regularly? Uh, well, I would have to get the Midnight Express book, but uh, 10 or 12 times, because not uh, since the middle of January, previous, because we'd just been in the territory full time since December 25th. So, and we had the two or three weeks around the horn of putover matches. So the, maybe, I don't know, maybe five or six, seven, eight times, somewhere around there. And so we'd never met. Dennis knew, Dennis and Bobby knew too. Look at that, the knee lift. And look at the, look at him sell the knee lift. Dennis and Bobby knew too from Georgia, but we'd never met Magnum for in our lives. And neither, none of them knew who I the fuck, who the fuck I was. Bobby actually started calling the knee lift and too loved the way that Bobby sold the knee lift. Every time he'd take a backflip bump or a sideways bump or go over the top rope or whatever. So two kept giving them to him. And then he realized about a month into this program, he's hitting Bobby with his finish three or four times every match and, and we're still winning. So then he stopped doing it. <laughs> he was, even, even two, you know, a fucking veteran like that. He got caught up in it. And, you know, once again, the baby faces have the people. Now we bail out. The people are still making noise. They're still into this thing. And now here, fucking Magnum wants to do a little chase scene. I've got Alice. Yeah, hey, Alice. <laughs> hey, I was not grabbing a feel. I was, I was really hiding for my life. And you see, the referee's trying to get control of this shit. And obviously, you know, they're not breaking the 10 count thing. We're just trying to fucking bail out and run. And, and uh, Bobby's trying to tell Magnum something. Looking around for something to use. And yep. And there we go. He, he's, he's like, God damn it too. I wanted to do this spot with Magnum. He was going to do the ass <laughs> bump into this chair spot, but. Yeah, he's going to do it anyway. God damn it. Uh, here we go. Okay. And boom. Oh my gosh. And the people go crazy. Look at the guy down here in the foreground, fucking pumping his fists in the air. Nobody has to do a dive. Nobody has to take a chance on breaking their fucking neck. Just get ass bumped onto the seat of the chair, not the spine of the chair, the seat of the chair. Fergie's the biggest guy in the ring. Yeah. 
poor Carl. He made a really good referee. He was a heck of a worker. He just didn't have the promo and the, you know, the oomph, but he made a great referee. And all we're doing here is just settling it. We're, we're scared. We're trying to fucking slow it down. And at the same time, the people are, look at all the people and Bobby gets his fucking hand stomped and people are ready to kill us. I love that black cop right there with the Afro. He was always right on, right behind me or on top of things. And he saved my neck right there behind Dennis on more than one occasion. Three piece suit you're wearing. Yeah, this is one I, I got a uh, Mike Duncan uh, pay pay w- for one out of every three special at the fucking mall in Hendersonville before I before I left Tennessee. I love it. Houston was so old fashioned. See the guy on the far side, the bald guy. They had ring seconds that were there just to take the jackets, and then they had the security guys, and then they had the the uniformed police with guns and batons. You had a lot of people around the ring. It got tight sometimes, but it, see the cops are always keeping an eye on everything. And you needed to here. And look at Magnum's punches. He's like, Dennis is like, fucking hell. Why did I call this? Get you off of me, you son of a bitch. Watch Dennis Condry. Everything he does is so sharp, so perfect. And a boom, Bobby with the spit. And, and now the slingshot in, boom. Magnum was so green here and he was stiff and you could tell the flipper punches. But at the same time, he just had so much fire, and he was such a good-looking athlete to people liked him, right? And he, you just needed to show that the baby faces were willing to kick ass, including the cameramans, I guess. Oh, here we go. <laughs> well, you got to it's a two-camera shoot, one play-by-play camera up here on the on the uh, the stage that you're seeing the entire ring and the other floor camera, and sometimes one of them would get the plug pulled and wouldn't work. That's why you got some Houston matches from this time period with only one camera. Okay, we've shined Magnum. Now let's get the old master in. And just look at those tie-ups. And right here, boom, and the old fucking heel discombobulated and <laughs> fucking two is trying to keep up with there. There's another knee lift. And the little dancing. This guy, he's, he's in his fucking 50s, but you can't tell because he's got the fucking mask on. Right? He doesn't look like old Johnny Walker. He looks like Mr. Wrestling 2. You just, at this point, we're shining the baby faces. They're outsmarting us. They're ducking. They're dodging. They're kicking of midnight's ass. We've got to establish that they're better than we are head up and face to face and and by the rules. So we've got to cheat and we're, we're not finished establishing that yet. I was going to say if in a few minutes from now, when Dennis gets back in, everything Dennis does was so precise, so perfect body language, everything, you're just always in the right place, timing and boom. And once again, Bobby just sells a punch to the face who sells like that anymore. Yeah, I was going to say before, I love the way he sells his mouth every time he's punched. He just holds yeah. it. Yeah. Now, what? He, he was he was waving at Dennis, come in. The referee sees Dennis, and now the ref, uh, wrestling two's got him by the hair and going to pull him back in to take more fucking advantage of him. And <clears throat> this was not hard to call because it was a grudge match, so it's supposed to be a fight. And... You know, even if if things didn't always work out perfectly, like we saw a minute ago, hey, get out of my way. I'm trying to do this spot. They just fucking went on and went with it because it wasn't supposed to look like such a choreographed, you know, exhibition. It was supposed to look like these guys were trying to do shit and the other guys were trying to stop them. And once again, Dennis's body language, he sells the gut. He fucking rubber leg. Boom, right into that. He doesn't know what Magnum's going to hit him with till he hits him. But now he's he's discombobulated and he's going to beg. So people does, are making people are making more noise when he begs and when they're in action. What were you going to say? Two does the old fashioned Irish whip, both hands on one. Oh wrist. yeah, both hands on the wrist, and he did the old fashioned backdrop too, turning sideways instead of head first, and that used to discombobulate Bobby. He hated that because Bobby could get. You, they didn't boost guys as as high up on backdrops in those days because the rings were harder. So <laughs> Bobby liked to take big ones anyway. And boom, uh, and the cameraman's gone again. I just love the way Dennis moves around the ring. He's always in motion, and he's always right there. How old is Dennis here? Uh, This is 1984. He is 33, I believe. Somewhere around there. 
And see, Dennis always looked old. Yeah, he never looks young. Dennis looked old when he was young. And there you go. And boom, two fucking nails Bobby and turns around and Dennis gets to cut him off because he he came from behind. And look at two cell. And there's another knee lift. And boom. And shot to Bobby who bounces (laughs) like a ping pong ball. Nobody, this was Bobby right there had been in the business for nine years. He's 25 years old. This is the biggest money spot he's ever had. He was working his ass off. By 1984, Bobby Eaton was probably the best Bobby ever because, and he was still lean because he hadn't, he couldn't afford to gain weight in Tennessee. Um, and it just, you know, I mean, we were all working our ass off, but Bobby especially to stand out. And now Dennis warning the referee, back him up and check the knee. He might have a foreign object implanted somewhere behind his bare kneecap. I always like when you see this version of the Express wearing matching colors. Looks good. Yeah, we didn't ha- we didn't have time to have any uh, robes made. Actually, those were, I think both uh, there were those were both Dennis's robes that they were wearing earlier because they we didn't have time to have anything made. We had two weeks notice. We were gonna, not even two weeks. We we're going to be a team. Okay. Anyway, now look at Bobby Eaton get fucking vicious. Look at that. You can see his fingers bent around the fucking guy's goozle pipe, even though he's putting no pressure on it. And look at the fucking motion. And there, and Dennis is over now with the fucking knocking the camera guy out of the way. It's just cheating. And it's cheating where the baby face has to portray that he can't overcome it. He can't get out from under it. He's being beleaguered and put upon. And now the referee fucking restores order too late. Oh, golly. And the he, two's going to, once he gets in a hold here in a few minutes, he's going to start his thing, and the people are going to start, they would chant, two, 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 two. And he'd put his two fingers up in the air. Bobby thought he was a cat, like he was going to scratch him at first with the fingers until he <laughs> saw he was signaling the people, two, two. Dennis had a hell of an atomic drop that you haven't seen in 20 years. And once again, back on the offense, vicious. That's why they call it getting heat. You're making the people mad because you're a vicious prick. And Bobby rear back and throws them. Boom. And and a fucking stumble cell because you don't know where you're at. They don't all have to be flat back bumps. You mentioned the atomic drop. That was actually Magnum's oh, first a, finisher in Mid-South. I'm about to say something. Ah, here we go. Dennis came off the top, but I'm telling Bobby something. I don't know what because you can't see me on, on camera. I think it was, ah, it could be the spot coming up here. Here we go. Because now Dennis is, that's what Dennis had told me to, yeah. Dennis draws the referee. I hand the fucking cherry and Bobby gives him the fucking shot. There we go. And look at two sell the fucking gut shot with the edge of the chair that he never felt. Like he's having goddamn abdominal ruptures. And the people are throwing shit and they're fucking mad. And, uh, you know, once again, I I hate to keep saying nobody works like so-and-so, but nobody works like any of these people anymore. They all work the same. And they all have to run through things at 100 miles an hour where it can't register. Boom. <laughs> and did too. I look, because he was so short and squat when he'd been over and... and it kind of bent down like that. He just it, look. It just it's it's a different way of fucking selling, and you work the guy's stomach, and that's what he would be saying to Dennis: just keep coming, keep coming, work the stomach, work the stomach. No daylight in between Bobby's hand and the chin, but you never feel it. Fergie giving it to Bobby there. And here we go one more time, Dennis. Dennis off the top rope. Oh, my God. That was deadly. That was a disqualification in Mid-South off the top rope. Well, yeah, that's why the referee couldn't see it. If you came off the top in Tennessee, too, and in most of the NWA territories, if you jumped off the top rope onto your opponent, you were disqualified because that was too dangerous a move to allow. 
So the referee's back's turned. Dennis come off the top rope with a fucking punch, and the people would go absolutely insane. Now, now they're two, 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 and he's doing his thing. He's fighting up from the chin lock, and the people see the people's fingers across the way. Two, 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 and now look at him fight. Look at him throw those fucking elbows. And Dennis with the leg trip, boom, and he had reached back and tagged. Here comes Bobby, kick to the fucking face, and that's the way that heels. Double team, immobilize the fucking opponent and fucking make a switch. Boom. Here comes Bobby. The referee's watching, so he's going to come off the second rope. And look at that knee. How is that ring in Houston? Harder than Chinese arithmetic. Hard. It, it had no give whatsoever. It had a lot of padding. R rings with a lot of padding and no give are fucking horrible. See, you, you can see it. It bounces a little bit, but it is mostly padding. And that means that you just put four layers of carpeting on your garage floor and then take a slam on it. Or take put one layer of carpeting on a trampoline and take a slam on that. Anyway, boom! Two's a little heavy there. Got a little satchel ass. I love the way Dennis would give guys the backbreaker like that and just shove them off like they were a sack of shit. And his kicks are so sharp. Some fan anyway. just got into your face. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, that was a regular occurrence. And he's going for the backdrop and the knee lift. And now, can he make the tag? And yes, he does. Holy shit. We didn't see that coming. And look at the people. And here we go. And Magnum, those things, half of them landed and half of them weren't anywhere in the stratosphere. Um... But he look at the fire. He's he's only been in the business a couple of years, but he's a guy that looks like that, that athletic. And uh oh, I just pulled the fucking rope down. He went over the top rope. The referee didn't see it. That would have been a disqualification. And now here he comes. <laughs> he's like, what the fuck? Now here fucking two's gone crazy. And I should mention that now where's Magnum? He said, fuck it. He walked right down the goddamn aisle way. The people said, where the fuck's he going? Dundee gave us this finish. I thought it was brilliant. He said, the people are going to think Magnum has left two to be beat up all by himself, right? No. Magnum goes back to the goddamn stage and finds a board and comes back to the ring carrying this piece of fucking lumber while his partner is being having the shit kicked out of him by the Midnight Express. And, of course, it took Magnum a little while that longer than we thought. And here he is. Boom! Listen to the fucking people. What a fucking pop. He breaks the board over Bobby's head. Bobby gets the fucking juice. Now he gives a piece of the board to, Matt, to Wrestling 2. And look at Dennis try to open himself up for that thing everywhere he could. <laughs> And it's chaos, and the fucking baby faces have been disqualified because Magnum came in with the fucking board. And Dennis is getting tired of that goddamn board. <laughs> and I've just thrown powder at Magnum, so I've blinded him so that I could get Bobby away from him. And now look, and the cops are already in front of us, and they're going to fucking corral us. We're going off to the left. And two says, come on, son, let's go get him. And holy shit, thank God we were running because they were running too and they meant it. And you can't see any more of it because the people fucking closed in. But that was our first main event in Houston and an example of what you can do with proper television promotion and people believing in what the fuck has been presented to them. I'm going to make a suggestion to everyone watching this watch along with us. Turn the volume up a little bit. There's no commentary. It's just the crowd noise. So I think it would really yeah. help for you to hear the crowd noise while Jim's well, explaining you go. everything. I didn't know you could. If you can do that, that would be all the better. Yes, a lot of these, the, the matches were were taped because Bosch's TV was an hour and a half long in Houston on Channel 39. Highest rated local program in the market. And what he would do is he, for years, he did his own television. He hosted his own interviews. He did his own commentary, did the TV from right there in the Coliseum. When he uh, hooked up with Watts, they used the one hour Mid-South wrestling program. And then the other 30 minutes minus the commercial time would be uh, clips from Houston matches, interviews that we did right there in the Sam Houston Coliseum in front of the live audience one night he's giving me shit, Paul Bosch is, and I'm giving him shit back. 
on the stage there and somebody threw a fucking quarter and it came right in between my glasses and my fucking eye and bounced off the glasses and back into my eye. And I still didn't fucking miss the goddamn promo line. Right. And Bosch comes back afterwards and says, God damn. Well, he didn't say God damn. He was a very eloquent man, but he said, heavens, Jim Cornette. He said, they hit you in the eye with that coin. You didn't even miss a beat on your promo. He loved that shit. Now, this uh, match was the semifinal on this show. You guys would be the main event of the next three shows in Houston. Well, I say that was our first main event, but that was that was our first main event. And that, let's face it, that was the main event. Be quite <laughs> honest. You saw the fucking people. That was the main event. But yes, the next three were main events. But anyway, and one about the television. So a lot of these tapes exist because they would roll tape on the entire match and then go back and either voice or just show clips or the finish or whatever to further the angles and the stories. Some of them have commentary because they intended to show the whole thing. So that's why some of these exist without any commentary because it was never meant you wouldn't, you didn't want to show everything on TV or else was nobody'd come and pay. You only wanted to tease them with it. But, uh, but I, I loved, I loved the whole local TV thing with Houston, not only it being an hour and a half reminded me of Memphis, but the, the, the local 30 minutes of content doing the interviews there in front of the people screaming. And it was so easy to, to, to get heat in that building because the people were just, as you saw, rocking and ready. So yeah, definitely watch the, the match with some of the sound up so that you can hear the pops because then you'll see what I'm talking about also with people popping on shit and losing their minds on shit that is a fraction of what you see today, but because it looked somewhat legitimate or was presented in the context of something like that board. Now these guys are taking bumps off fucking, you know, towers 50 feet high and fucking running over each other with cars and you know, sticking hand grenades up each other's asses. One well-placed board shot when it means something to a guy that you want to see get cracked, when it changes the tone of a fucking confrontation, will blow the house every time. 16 fucking shots with the same fucking board in the same way with the same people will stink the joint out. Yeah, we saw a lot of fans jumping up and down, pumping their yeah. fists in the air. You don't really see that anymore. I saw some fans in Houston jumping up over the rail and back down on, on my side <laughs> to get to me. And that's why I like those guys. There were literally four uniform. Well, it, since this was the first one, they hadn't got the full cornet yet. But after the next match, two weeks later, when Bosch had to stop us because he was afraid we were going to start a riot, they had four uniformed police officers with batons and pistols behind me, not just all around ringside, behind me in Houston uh, including that one black guy with the Afro I told you about on every single show, just for my personal protection. Well, there it is. Our latest watch along. What will we watch next week? You'll have to tune in and find out, but of course we welcome your suggestions on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. Let us know what matches you'd like Jim to watch and lend us expert analysis too and i think this was a really good one oh, we got to do all these houston matches the fantastic ones the midnight express ones and of course you know what there's a real good fantastics match from the myriad in oklahoma city out there also oh we might ought to do that one were you upset that you won the tag titles in i mean you didn't win it in houston or new <laughs> orleans or tulsa you won it in lake charles no lafayette lafayette excuse me lafayette which you know, when you see the video of it, it's like, eh, this doesn't look like the greatest building to. Oh, no, no. It, it was uh, the uh, the auditorium in Lafayette. The ring was on a stage and it was like an auditorium and it only seated. Oh, God, I don't know if it seated 2000 people. I know that we set gate records there in that town four times in a row, four shows in a row because we sold out. Then they increased the ticket prices, sold out again, increased prices, sold out again, and finally brought the last stampede in and sold out again. So we had a string where we were drawing the same amount of people but breaking the gate record because it was such a small building. But the reason why it was chosen to be there is because it worked out in the schedule because the not only did it need to – we needed to get the tag team titles in that match, but also that had to be the time that two walked out on T.A., and it had to work out with the next TV taping they were going to do and the next round of matches where two would face TA and all that stuff. So it just worked out 
that it was convenient to do it in Lafayette. And also it looked, they wanted to do it at a house show because it looked like it was even more unplanned. You'll never believe what happened when wrestling Two walked out on his partner, Magnum TA and left him to take the lashes from the midnight express. It was in Lafayette. So, I mean, this was, it's not hard. It's not complicated shit. It was very intricate. Once you knew what you were doing and how to do it, it wasn't complicated, but it was very intricate, this booking in Mid-South. So, yeah, I wasn't upset about when. I'm just glad we won them, but it wasn't, you know, the Houston, Sam Houston Coliseum or the Myriad in Oklahoma City or the Superdome or whatever, but we had plenty of those too. And at that point, we were just, we were happy to be there. I was especially happy to be there at that point. I'm like, what? How the fuck did this happen? I went from my my last check in Tennessee for one working one day that week was for fucking fifty dollars, and suddenly I'm making three grand a week two months later. I'm like, what the fuck? All right. Well, with that, the drive through is officially closed. All right. Drop this down. <laughs> Of course, you can hear the Jim Cornette experience when it debuts Friday, wherever you find your favorite podcast, or listen to it anytime along with the drive through on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, closing in on 150,000 subscribers right now. Be one of them. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. Be one of them. Hell, be two or three of them. Well, we don't want to encourage cheating here. Voter Who doesn't? fraud. We don't want voter fraud on the YouTube channel. Who doesn't? Channel. Well, you can. You're Jim Cornette, the cheating manager. <laughs> just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll come right up. Full episodes, clips of episodes, and omnibus collections. Get with it today. Of course, you can access the archive, patreon.com slash Cornette. Another batch of episodes goes up each and every Sunday night. We are now in 2015. And we just put up an episode with Danny Davis. We talked about OVW on the shows recently. Here, Jim and Danny talk OVW in 2015. Once again, patreon.com slash Cornette. Only $5 a month gets you a membership. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Two episodes, the opening day special, and the extra innings, baseball and wrestling talk. Available right now, 605pod.com. Cornets Collectibles, where international orders get delayed until Monday. What's going on there today, Jim? International orders are delayed till Monday. <laughs> get your official Jim Cornet merchandise, autograph photos, burger towels, t-shirts. And whatever else is actually still in stock, jimcornet.com. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888 692 8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Friday on the experience, and next week, right back here on the drive through for another watch along for Jim Cornet, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho!